Hello and welcome to the Building a Next Generation IT Environment Megacast event brought to you by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis and I'm excited to be your moderator for today's event. On the event today, you'll learn about solutions from NetApp, Nutanix, Okta, SolarWinds, and Flexential. We have an awesome event lined up for you today. It's our first event of 2020, and this is going to be a great event. You may notice we've got a brand new console. We've got a chat box. We've got a new slide background. We have some new presenters, and we have some awesome new prizes. So you're in for a special treat today. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping here we first need to cover. I mentioned prizes. In just a moment, I'll talk about the requirements to be eligible for those prize drawings and what prizes we're giving away on today's event. As always, we want this to be an educational event, so we encourage you to use the Q&A tab that's there in your audience console. And In fact, I'll try to shake it right now to draw your attention to it. Just go ahead and click on that tab, and that's the Q&A tab that we're going to be using for any technical questions related to today's topics and today's presentations. So if you have IT challenges, that's the place to put them. If you have questions for our presenters, that's the place to put those questions. And that's exactly where the answers will be coming in as well. And then we're trying something new today. It's the chat box. I encourage you to use the chat box for all your social interactions with me as the moderator and your fellow participants. We're going to see how the chat box works today. We welcome your feedback on it. Feel free to help one another out in the chat box and put all your positive comments about the event in the chat box as well. And all those hello messages that come in at the start of the event, we love to get those. We love to hear where everyone is from. Please use the chat box for those. I'm going to try to shake the chat box right now to draw your attention to it so you can check it out. Feel free to say hello in there. I'll be responding to as many questions as I can in the chat box, but we still encourage you to use the Q&A tab for all your technical product questions. We want those questions to keep coming in. Again, we want this to be an educational event, and our expert presenters are here to answer your technical questions. I'll also have a few poll questions for you throughout the event. And then social. We want this to be a social event as well. I'll be tweeting about the event over on Twitter, I'll talk about the hashtag in just a moment, but you can tweet directly from your audience console and the hashtag for today's event will be automatically appended. And then finally, resources. We have a number of handouts. They're there on the handouts tab. I'll try to shake that right now so you can check it out and download the handouts from today's presenters. This is a completely live event. As you know, things can and sometimes do go wrong with live events. Hopefully not today, but if something does go wrong, we appreciate your patience in advance Nine times out of 10, a refresh on your web browser will resolve any technical issues. Now, the prizes on today's event, I said we have new prizes. Here they are. We're giving out five ThinkPad X1 Carbon Gen 7 laptops. That's right. These are some really cool laptops. I wish I had one of these myself. And to top it off, the icing on the cake is we'll be giving out an Amazon $500 gift card after every presentation on the Megacast. This is one of the reasons we call it a mega cast because we have mega prizes. Now the requirements to be eligible for the prize drawings. First off, you must be present on the live event. You have the option to make a donation to a selected charity. We would love to help you do that. And all prize winners must submit an IRS form W9 to actual tech media. Full prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. There's a link right there to events.actualtechmedia.com. Now, through the Megacast and Ecocast event series, we have given out thousands of dollars to the charities that you see on the screen, thanks to generous attendees who win prizes and opt to donate their prize value to charity. When we contact you about your prize, please keep this in mind. Now, the hashtag for today's event is ATM for Actual Tech Media, ATM Megacast. I'll be following that hashtag. I encourage you to follow Actual Tech Media and me, David M. Davis, on Twitter as well. Now, Actual Tech Media has been very active this last year on LinkedIn, and we will continue to be. I encourage you to follow us over on LinkedIn, as well as YouTube, Facebook, and our very popular 10 on Tech podcast. And now it's time to kick off today's special megacast with a special keynote interview. That is with Mr. Bill Clayman, author, blogger, speaker, and executive vice president of digital solutions at Switch. 
And I must say that this interview has been sliced down because Bill and I had a great conversation that went rather long, and I've taken the best tidbits of that interview and used it for this keynote. But I'll be promoting the full interview over on Twitter, and you'll also find it on the Actual Tech Media recently posted YouTube video list. I'm excited to be joined by Mr. Bill Clayman, good friend of mine. Great to have you on the event today. How's it going, Bill? Uh, it's, it's fantastic. It's a new year. Uh, and, you know, I'm just excited about all the amazing things I'm already hearing about. We don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but some of the things at CES, for example, we've got like 30 seconds at the end. I'll tell you my favorite stuff in there. But pleasure to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Always good to have you on. You are by far the most energetic person in enterprise tech that I know, and I love your passion. Um, so let's kick it off. You know, I know you were telling me you've been working on some really cool reports uh, that will soon be published. Uh, the 2019 Information Week State of Infrastructure uh, and the 2019 State of Data Center for AFCOM. Um, tell us what you've learned in those reports and, and uh, tell us what's going on with those. Man, uh, it, there's so much information. And in the span of six minutes, I'm going to try and recap some of the things that we're going to be uh, researching and looking at. One of the things I want to talk about really briefly is everything that you're hearing about 5G. I'm sorry if this is a word you're already sick of. Uh, it's not like cloud or digital transformation. Okay, uh, I'll try and keep this brief. But it, it was a really interesting report recently that said in 2016, 4G, right? If you take a look at your phone, you probably see the little 4G logo up on the top. Already in 2016, 4G was carrying about 70% of the total mobile traffic and actually represented the largest share of traffic by any network type. So we're already seeing that saturation. That number is slated to grow to 80% of overall data traffic by 2021. So this is where the stuff called 5G actually comes in, where it's very high bandwidth. We're talking like 100 megabits per second. If you're standing right and you're pointing this thing to the tower, it's nearby you, you're going to get speeds of one to two gigs with very, very low latency. I'm talking like one millisecond or less. Now, guys, this is why this is so important. In the future, very near future, I'm talking like the next two to three years, this is the way we're going to be communicating and talking. And I'm not just talking about how fast you can download cat videos, but deliver <laughs> applications different types of content, the way we utilize remote rural locations. I mean, think about telemedicine, connected cities, airplanes, cars, all of these things are going to be given a digital life from once analog systems. So all of a sudden, all this data needs to be processed. I implore everybody to do your own research, check out what 5G is, um, you know, how there's different frequencies, licensed and unlicensed, how they impact different organizations, um, and really what the true applications are around it. This is not going away. This is the future of what we're going to be doing as far as communications is concerned. And most of all, this is the way we're going to bring my goodness, life-changing, life-altering technologies to places and parts of the world that could never experience this stuff. Um, so I think, I think, David, that's a big one that we're seeing across both that information, state of infrastructure report, as well as what we're seeing around things like 5G and Edge in the AFCOM State of the Data Center report as well. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, one of the cool things I saw recently was uh, startups who are selling faces of people created by computers. You know, so you don't have to pay someone a licensing royalty for an actor or a, a model or something like that. They sell faces that can be used in products and videos and that look completely real. Uh, another cool thing I saw was AI that's scanning uh, x-rays and, and mammograms to identify cancer tumors better than, you know, any doctor can. So it, some really impressive stuff coming out. Um, but if you heard a, a ding, that's because... We're running low on time, so we should probably move into our lightning round. I know you're almost always on a lightning round, Bill, but um, <laughs> let's jump in. Let's talk about you know data centers versus cloud. Yes. Uh, I mean, is the data center still uh, relevant today? What's the future of the data center? So I, this is one of my favorite questions because I remember standing uh, on stage at AFCOM Data Center World in front of you know more than a thousand people, and I had this question come up. Cloud will not kill the data center. I want everybody to take a look at what's actually happening in the data center itself. First of all, the business continues to boom, but in not in a way that maybe you and I think about it. First of all, we're using space a lot more intelligent. So density, uh, using things like hyper-converged technologies, integrating deeply with virtualization and cloud systems. But beyond that, take a look at Google Anthos, uh, Azure Stack, AWS Outpost, major public cloud providers between you and me, 
conceded a little bit of a loss saying, listen, not everything lives in the cloud and it doesn't need to be in the cloud, but I still want to get my services over into your environment. So you can now buy an entire rack of for you of something called an AWS outpost. And all of a sudden you have Amazon web services services running within your environment S three buckets, uh, different kinds of applications that you can develop directly on site. So we're blurring this definition of what a data center is and what cloud is with these privatized hybrid clouds. And maybe we just came up with a new word. Um, but I think <laughs> that the data center is still very important, um, very much critical. Uh, and as you can see, these major cloud providers are trying to find ways to get into your private ecosystem to continue to let you leverage the power of cloud. So really interesting stuff happening out there. So data center is still a thing and the public cloud providers are you know, trying to uh, make an offering for an on-premises offering. And I love the term privatized, hybrid, hyper-converged, digitally transformed cloud. What was it? Something like that. That is an extremely long <laughs> word. Uh, we'll keep it simple, called privatized hybrid clouds that okay. are, are, are now operating in a much more dense ecosystem that tries to fill up um, resource buckets that are avail already available. Again, why hyper-converged infrastructure across all these reports that I've been doing continues to be at the top level of infrastructure investment. Get rid of those pizza boxes, create density, and try and put as many users on there as you can. Definitely a big trend out there. Okay, so hyperconverse, uh, definitely a big trend. What other, what other uh, big trends are uh, popping up in the surveys that you're doing, Bill, for on-premises data centers? I wanna give you guys a really interesting point. And if you're running an enterprise data center, you're working with a co-location, you got a good partner out there, ask the question of how smart is your data center? How predictive and prescriptive are the tools that are managing my critical infrastructure? That means how integrated are they with DCIM, my data center infrastructure management? Uh, maybe there's a DCOS, a data center operating system that you're working with out there, proprietary, maybe publicly available. Our data centers are becoming much smarter. And across the board, the people are saying that they're putting in smart sensors, they're leveraging data. These data-driven environments are now producing a lot more information that we can leverage every single day to make, again, predictive and prescriptive decisions around our environment. A day of outage can cost upwards of $3 million for some organizations, especially in the healthcare and pharmaceutical space. So you know that this, this criticality of keeping your environment up and running. The biggest things that I'm seeing out there are data-driven, data center management solution that give you deep insight and pattern analysis to the point of where you've never been able to see it before and even be able to predict issues inside of your private data center that you may have not been able to see if you're just kind of looking at you know, real-time trends and patterns. That's the future. If you take a look at your own tool set right now and you're missing that data-driven element, take a step back. Do a POC, do a little bit of research because there's some really cool products out there that give you that sort of visibility. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to the owner of a MSP uh, actually yesterday who has, you know, hundreds of VMs. He has his own data center and he said, you know, ransomware is just really keeping him up at night um, because uh, he's buying cyber insurance. He's doing uh, penetration tests constantly. You know, he says it's not when it's, it's not uh, if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. Um, so that's to me how scary uh, security is right now. And before we go, I want to just touch on, you know, Switch. I know you're the executive vice president of digital solutions at Switch, uh, one of the largest data center companies in the world. Uh, tell us what's new at Switch. Um, aside from us continuing to be uh, these builders of a digital and sustainable future, um, you know, we continue to do a lot of really cool philanthropic programs. We continue to support things like first robotics and help kids build robots. And on that note, we're also doing some really cool with cool things with uh, um, IoT connected devices and even things like drones. Um, on August first, actually of, of 2019, just as recently, we actually concluded an unmanned traffic management pilot program um, with the FAA and a couple of other partners as well, um, where uh, this autonomous system technology was actually housed and worked from our own data center here at Switch. So we are at this centerpiece of connected cities, connected environments, working with unmanned traffic management systems, these pilot programs in the state of Nevada to create these historic uh, FAA partnerships um, to create unmanned traffic and, and traffic systems. Um, that's so cool. And that's a part of this whole edge environment that we're talking about as well as being able to light up remote spots and remote cities uh, to allow for things like drones and other unmanned aerial vehicles to do different kinds of services. 
Um, another really fun piece of news is that we are opening and launching our hyperscale Atlanta location. Uh, it's going to be more than a million square feet and up to about uh, 110 megawatts of power uh, upon completion. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous location. Um, you know, basically on par with everything else that we try and create from a unique pr perspective. Um, so if you're in that area, by all means, check it out. It's, it's going to be an amazing facility. It's almost done. By all means, also book a <laughs> tour out there to check it out. Um, we're doing some amazing things as always. You can always just go to switch.com, follow us on social media. Um, and we'll tell you about all the fun things that we're creating in this very digital world. Very exciting stuff, Bill. I mean, that new Atlanta data center is right in my part of the country. So I may be actually hitting, hitting you up for a tour of that data center. It sounds completely awesome. Uh, Bill, it's always great chatting with you. It's always fun, uh, talking to you about technology. You make technology exciting and I appreciate that. Uh, thanks so much, Bill. It is a pleasure, David. Thank you so much. And everybody watching this, hey, keep building amazing things and keep doing it together. Thanks, everybody. You can follow Bill Clayman on Twitter, where he is QuadStack. All right, really cool interview there with uh, our good friend, Bill. Um, before I introduce you to our first presenter on the event today, I mean, this is the first event of the new year. And this question is relevant. Uh, I'm curious to find out the answer. You should see a poll question there in the slides window. And it says, where are you most planning to spend your time and your company's money on improving your IT environment in 2020? So I'm curious to see, you know, is it data prote protection and DR, security, private, hybrid, public cloud? You know, with so many companies out there, you're still doing infrastructure consolidation and refresh. It, it never ends. Um, is edge computing you know, really a thing? What about containers and Kubernetes? It's in the media, uh, just like cloud, it's in the press, but is that something that real companies are doing out there? Or are there other projects on this list that aren't listed? And feel free to put other projects not on this list in the chat, because I'd like to know, you know what do I need to include in this um, poll question the next time we run it? Uh, I wanna have all the possibilities here included as much as possible. So, um, Let's see, it's, it's a good horse race to watch. I see the votes coming in live. Thank you everyone for responding to this poll question. Let me share the results of this with you now. And take a look at that. Uh, the number one most popular place to spend time and money in 2020 for your IT environment is security. 53% said security. And that was followed by infrastructure consolidation and refresh, it, it never ends. And then after that, uh, data protection and DR. Uh, that's one of the most popular events we do here at Actual Tech Media uh, because it seems like, you know, that's a constant concern. Is uh, our data protection solid? Is it scalable? Uh, is our DR solution uh, going to provide the RTO and the RPO our company needs? So that was the third uh, uh, runner up there. And then followed by 28% said private hybrid or public cloud. Very interesting to see. So thank you for responding to that question. And now it's time to kick off uh, our first presentation on today's Megacast. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Cindy Gutowski, Senior Product Marketing Manager at NetApp. Cindy, thank you for being on. Hey, David, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Cindy Gutowski, as David just mentioned. I'm a Product Marketing Manager at NetApp, and I've been with NetApp for about two years. However, I'm no stranger to the industry. I've got over three decades of experience and have seen a lot of innovations and changes in this world. And in fact, today we are going to take a look and preview into some of um, the most recent 2020 IT predictions. So my first thing, my favorite cartoon, actually my favorite cartoon is the Flintstones. However, January 1st, I popped onto social media only to find this. Here we are in 2020 and we don't have flying cars yet, like the Jetsons had, had predicted. So I thought about it a little bit and I dug into this. What does this mean? So if you recall, the Jetsons cartoon aired in 1962 and it was featured in a setting that was represented 100 years into the future, which would put that into the year 2062. Of course, we're still 62 years away from that. However, what they predicted is not too far off from where we are today. While we may not have flying cars and jetpacks quite yet, we do have a lot of other things that the Jetsons featured in their 
futuristic world, including electronic toothbrushes. You know, while we have a lot of things that they predicted, there are also a lot of things that we've already surpassed surpassed as to what they were able to do in their futuristic world. Now we are progressing past the Jetsons where they had remote controls to activate their many technologies. And we have advanced to machine-to-machine -machine communications and self-driving cars. I know I don't have a crystal ball to see what 2062 holds. However, I do have some predictions for what technologies in 2020 will impact IT. Although I would like a flying car and it would be fun to have a jetpack. <laughs> so the top three technology trends in 2020, of course, they don't work in a vacuum. And you know, we are in such a transitional phase right now with so many innovations hitting the ground and impacting how we operate as humans um, or as business owners, um, our responsibilities for IT. And one of my New Year's resolutions is to keep an eye on what technologies I can benefit from for me personally or what my business can benefit from as a marketeer. So that said, during the holiday break, I took some time and took a look at the 2020 IT predictions to see what was up. Oh my gosh, everybody was weighing in. I think I reviewed over 50 um, industry analysts and corporations 2020 IT predictions. And after going through much of them, I summarized it up to these top three that were the most common and what I believe to be the most impactful in IT development and will have a huge impact on um, our enabling technologies, whether as a human being in IT or as a business owner. So the first one leading, leading the, the charge, hybrid and multi-cloud architectures will become the norm. No surprise there. Hybrid clouds in 2019 data centers, real, hybrid clouds in 2019. Data centers started to realize that public clouds were too expensive and they needed to find a balance between on-premises and public clouds. Hence the introduction of private clouds. And with the introduction of private clouds, of course, the next action was how do we balance between public clouds and private clouds? Introducing hybrid clouds. Hybrid clouds are all the rage today, and most interesting was the ESG article that I read after they surveyed hundreds of IT directors or decision makers and discovered that 91% of them identified hybrid cloud environments as being the ideal model for their IT environment, yet only 18% of them indicated that they have that model today. Being a marketeer and in IT, to me that says, there's a lot of opportunity out there and there's a lot of problem solving to be done to help those customers get to a hybrid environment. The second most talked about area and at the top of mind for enterprises is the edge. No surprise here, data creation outside of the data center is accelerating and IT needs to plan for infrastructure deployment at the edge. Imagine that. Tap on 5G and IoT these two things, these two innovative technologies will bring even more focus to the edge. The predictions between two leading analysts, IDC and Gartner, are, are definite true testaments to the acceleration of data creation outside of the data center at the edge. I think some of the numbers that are written here from, from Gartner and IDC, by the year 2023, 50% of all enterprises, IT infrastructure will be deployed at at the edge, mm, that's a lot. In the next few slides, to dive deeper, oh, uh, we got one more, ah, my favorite one, Kubernetes, <laughs> data and application persistence for cloud mobility. One other thing that we've seen or that I've noticed being from NetApp and being in a Kubernetes provider, we are seeing enterprises deploying containers on premises for more than just native apps. Um, they are trying to find ways to solve for um, DevOps on on premise and not just up in private clouds. We've noticed that a lot of these customers have been in a trial basis for containers on site, and we suspect by 2020 we're going to start seeing a lot of those containers, i.e., Kubernetes, starting to go into production. All right. So in the next few slides, I'm going to kind of dive in a little bit deeper as to what these top three trends 
what's driving them and what you should plan for as an end user and or a customer and or consider. So today when people talk about the cloud, they usually mean the public cloud. This will change in 2020. The term cloud will become more nuanced as more businesses deploy private clouds and organizations increasingly pursue a hybrid cloud strategy that gives them the best of both worlds. It's no surprise that most corporate data centers have concluded that the public clouds cost more than running their own data centers and are starting to pull that data back from the public cloud. Enterprises are doing only specific projects in the public cloud, such as archive data, um, some dev operations for personal compute, et cetera. Hmm. This is what I find is interesting. The decrease in infrastructure expenses, automation and cloud services on premises are starting to fuel the momentum behind the use of private clouds on premises and we are seeing enterprises deploy more hybrid cloud infrastructures. We are seeing enterprises deploy more private clouds and on premises than they are um, using the public cloud. The hybrid cloud infrastructures they have to be agile and, and they can also help prepare for what's to come. Of course, as I already mentioned on the first couple of slides, 2020 is, is a year of significant change with edge computing, 5G, IoT, and AI. These hybrid cloud infrastructures need to be agile to help these customers plan for the future. Now let's not forget about the three public, the big three public clouds. They too have recognized and have felt the pain of enterprises pulling back out of, out of their environments and starting to do more on-prem. So, so they, you're going to see, and if you're not already, have noticed that public clouds are starting to ramp up offerings to gain more footprint on-premises. Um, GKE is a great example of, of bringing Kubernetes services on-premise. Um, all three cloud providers are looking at how they can continue gaining momentum and growing revenue, not just in a public cloud environment, but in a, in a hybrid cloud environment. And I think in 2020, you are going to see a lot more offerings and services provided from the public cloud that will cater to the public cloud environment, along with consistent management and still that ease of use and um, with, with easy consumption models. So today many companies are in, are in very, today we're seeing um, many companies are in some type of hybrid cloud state and customers are expecting that vendors provide an even more seamless experience between on-premise hardware infrastructures and cloud infrastructures, right? So what does that mean? Enterprises expect the same scale and acquisition flexibility along with the performance, access, and security advantages they got from the public cloud platforms. You know, I'd like to say they got spoiled by what public cloud was able to add, was able to provide them. It was a um, easy purchase model, you know, pay for it and forget it. They didn't have to do um, upgrades. They now are expecting that seamless, consistent management between public cloud and private cloud. So that's something to watch out for or something to consider when you're deploying a hybrid cloud environment. Look for that consistent management. Look for hybrid cloud infrastructures that are um, disaggregated, that are easy to acquire, that have automation and are easy to, to upgrade. So, you know, customers can also expect the a multi-cloud, you know, customers, so I guess a multi-cloud, also expect a multi-cloud experience. And this multi-cloud experience also doesn't lock them into any one or any single public cloud provider. So I always like to call it cloud ag agnostic. The beauty of hybrid cloud environments is having the option to use any public cloud and your own private cloud and be able to move data between any public cloud and your on-premises. Hmm, that would be a perfect world. But with the enablers that are coming in 2020, things that you should consider for your environment, that ability to move from any cloud. Again, a cloud is a cloud is a cloud. All right. Uh, 
5G and IoT will bring more focus to the edge. So I don't know if you realize this, but another interesting point I read over the holidays was currently 75% of enterprise data is created in branch offices uh, on mobile devices and by IoT-enabled smart devices. Data growth outside the data center is the new reality, obviously, and it's creating a need for enterprises to deploy computing power and storage capabilities at the network edge, i.e. edge computing and or our Gartner describes it as micro clouds at the edge. And with the introduction of 5G and IoT, that will bring more focus to the edge and enable the edge even more. And this will be the new battleground for our cloud service providers who are looking to extend their reach beyond the cloud, right? So the arguments for edge computing are compelling. Um, edge computing, um, the closer you get the computing to the applications and to the data, the less, less latency you have for applications like autonomous vehicles. Think about all the autonomous vehicles that are out there. And then the integration of operation technology and IT also helps to improve business. <clears throat> you know, so, <laughs> however, the edge is like the wild west. OT facilities like factories and manufacturing sites were run in a closed environment, right? And the lack, and lack of disciplines that we introduced in our IT environments where applications and data had to exist in a shared and open environment. The protocols, networks, and systems on the edge are very diverse and low cost, while IT systems are standardized and generally higher cost. You're going to see an emergence or um, you're going to need a gateway that's going to be used to integrate the two types of systems between core and the edge. But another thing to look out for to enable your input edge environment. And with 5G, it will enable everything everywhere that make technologies such as AR, VR, and, and smart connected devices possible. AI-enabled intelligent infrastructures will get deployed at massive scale and disrupt the high-performance computing industry. It's another thing that I think is very, very interesting. Edge build-out is already happening. If you're not already planning for it, it's something you should consider. And its pace is accelerating with trends like IoT, self-driving cars, biometrics. In fact, IDC has predicted that by 2023, 50% of all enterprise IT infrastructure will be deployed at the edge. So start planning for what that IT infrastructure must sustain to hold up and handle edge environments. All right. Hmm. So the next slide, 2020 will be the year of Kubernetes, or Kubernetes is the new black, however you want to describe it, but enterprises are focusing on a range of container user, user use cases beyond just cloud native applications as they explore containerizing legacy applications and add support for big data and other workloads. So. So bringing, bringing containers on site and having the ability to develop and move your applications and their data between any cloud gives you the flexibility to have applications and data anywhere at any time whenever they're needed. In 2020, containers and multi-cloud implementations will continue to accelerate. Most enterprises will push to create flexible computing environments where multiple clouds serve specific strategic purposes. We see that ITs or that data centers will start embracing the flexibility containers promise, creating setups where containers can move freely between public cloud, private cloud, and on-premises environments. Again, this is making a hybrid cloud, enabling a hybrid cloud uh, a reality, being able to move your applications between any public cloud and on-premise along with its data. In fact, VMware, VMware, um, VMware is doing this today. I don't know if you're familiar with Project Pacific. Excuse me, I'm going to take a drink. Uh -huh. So Project Pacific is one of the first examples of, of this capability. 
the move to containerize applications and orchestrate them with Kubernetes is already underway and is driving rapid application deployment and portability in enterprises led by DevOps. Project specific is a bold move to extend vSphere with Kubernetes and get traditional IT admins into the mix by having vSphere and Kubernetes now manage IT infrastructure. Another trend that you're going to see is IT and, and um, DevOps starting to merge and, and DevOps having the capability to manage IT infrastructure. I mentioned that roles and responsibilities starting to mix and match. Enterprises have been pilot, pilot testing in Kubernetes and containers, and, and I think in the year 2020, we're going to start seeing them show up and in production needed more. And I think on the first slide, um, we identified that the Kubernetes is going to take off like gangbusters, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but watch out for Kubernetes and containers on premise. So what does this mean for you in, and in your environment? Data and applications everywhere drive new business opportunities that demand data center efficiencies. Digital transformations and innovations are driven by business goals, strategic requirements, and the cloud. This means in a cloud, this means in a cloud first world, you will have clouds that must provide seamless transitions for workload mobility. They must operate where the work is being done in your code, data, and security assets must be persistent for the life of a work stream. So as we look forward, we see three business imperatives that enable new customer experiences, help companies open new business opportunities while optimizing operational efficiencies, consolidating onto a single platform, having a, a disaggregated architecture that supports a multi-hybrid cloud uh, environment, plus supports, um, it, it supports information or infrastructures from the edge, from the core to the edge into any cloud um, is going to be key and crucial. So I think um, ITs are going to experience, IT is going to experience um, some changes in their environment. They should start expecting and looking for automa auto automation. They should start looking for um, infrastructures that can accommodate, are agile, that can scale, and that have a um, acquisition model that's, that's as easy as it is in public cloud environments. Uh, so a little bit of plug. In today's world, you know, in, in to accommodate what's going on with hybrid cloud, what's going on with the edge, um, 5G, IoT, and what's happening with DevOps and containers on site, and enabling the ability to move your applications and data from cloud to cloud, on-prem, and in, in the public. You need to seek out a vendor or, and or a trusted vendor who is, who is cloud agnostic. And with cloud consumption and services designed to be just as agile, simple, and scalable as a public cloud, and it must have consistent management that permits you to move data and applications from cloud to data centers to edge and back or wherever you need it. And this has been NetApp's vision for probably well over six years. You know, NetApp has been innovating data strategies for nearly 30 years and understands that data is the lifeblood of organizations, right? And it, it has now risen to become critical to business success. Data, data, is, is, um, data is gold, data is king. Um, you lose it, you lose a lot of your business. You, don't, you can't go back and analyze it, you can't go back and research, you can't go back and, and, and create the business opportunities that you could um, without, without all, all of that data. So you need to ensure your data is available, you need to ensure it's, ensure it's where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, and when it needs to be available. And NetApp knows that data is anywhere and everywhere. Who doesn't, right? And in every form imaginable. And it's growing by the minute. 
And data is stored in public clouds, private clouds, and on-premises. It's everywhere. And your teams need to leverage it to do their job. Businesses depend on data to survive and grow. And NetApp's vision for the data fabric has been in place since I think we introduced it in 2014. Um, and NetApp enables you to design your, your data fabric. And it's not NetApp's data fabric. NetApp has the enabling technologies that helps you to enable your fabric that gives you the ability to move your data and your applications to public, private cloud, on-prem, off-prem, at the edge, at the core, wherever you need it or wherever you need to analyze it as fast as you need to analyze it to make those business decisions quickly. Um, and my plug for NetApp. <laughs> the data fabric, and it's your data fabric that enables it. But most of all, um, NetApp, it's been NetApp's vision for quite some time, and it's something that we've been working on for several years, and it's become a reality for us. We've made it a reality for hundreds and thousands of customers. So the power of our strategy is the data fabric, right? And customers tell us that they need help because multi-cloud, um, hybrid multi-clouds and hybrid cloud infrastructure is difficult, it's hard, it's, it's complex. How do you get data from point A to point B, right? How do we truly make that happen? And our data fabric strategy solves those customers' hybrid multi-cloud problems. We have hardware, we have software, we have services, we have acquisition models. Whether it's on-prem, whether it's managed, or whether you manage it yourself, we are constantly moving and orchestrating data among all, all, you, their, all your various Places, whether you need it at the edge core, private, public cloud, on-prem, off-prem, um, that's, that's what NetApp does. And that's what NetApp's been working on and, and is working with all the major public cloud providers. You know, NetApp was one of the first ones to, to move to the cloud. And in our approach to private clouds with a disaggregated HCI, designed for and built for multi-cloud infrastructures. It was purposely built for the cloud, specifically for multi-cloud um, environments. And not just that, NetApp's portfolio enables your data fabric to move applications and data to where they need it and when you need it. I'm gonna leave you with this slide, but before I do, I'm gonna answer any questions that you may have. Doesn't stop here. You can reach out and contact your, your NetApp rep, um, visit us on netapp.com, and follow us on Twitter. All right, great presentation, Cindy. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have Cindy standing by in the Q&A tab there to answer all your questions about Cindy's 2020 predictions, about the NetApp data platform, uh, anything that came to mind during the presentation, please use the Q&A tab there to enter your questions. I appreciate all the comments that are coming in there in the chat box. Uh, thank you for those. I love seeing attendees help other attendees uh, with IT challenges. Uh, but if you have tech, tech questions about the presentation, again, please use the Q&A tab. So uh, I posted a, a poll question on the screen that just says, what additional information would you like about the NetApp solution? And I'll just leave that up there while I announce our first set of prize winners. So uh, let's see, first uh, prize winner is for an Amazon $500 gift card. That's going to Josh Griffith of Arizona. Congratulations, Josh Griffith of Arizona. And our first grand prize winner for our laptop is Rudy Wilkinson of New Hampshire. Congratulations, Rudy Wilkinson of New Hampshire. If you haven't answered the poll question on the screen there. I encourage you to do that. Uh, let's see. Some good feedback here coming in in the chat. Uh, congratulations, of course, to everyone. Uh, appreciate all the questions that are coming in there in the Q&A. Uh, David's got a good question uh, for Cindy about which cloud providers does uh, your storage support. I will assign that to Cindy. Uh, good feedback coming in. Thank you so much. But it's, it's now time to move on to our next presentation. And with that, I'm excited to introduce Krish, who is the Director of Product Marketing at Nutanix. Uh, Krish, take it away. 
Thank you for joining us on this webinar. Over the next 20 to 25 minutes, we'll talk about why you need private cloud and how to go about building one. My name is Krishnan Badri Narayanan, Director of Product Marketing at Nutanix. Now, CEOs need you to drive growth. It is only when companies obsess about customer experience, products and services, market dynamics, and leverage technology to improve those products and services that they truly help their companies gain competitive advantage. And there's no better time than now for you as members of the IT organization to lean in in the boardroom and help your CEOs disrupt as opposed to be disrupted. However, all that is easier said than done. We still need to go through that very painful process of negotiating with multiple vendors to acquire the different elements of the infrastructure and the data center, then carefully integrate them before they are deployed into production, and then manage all this complex infrastructure across silos of specialists, one for storage, compute, networking, virtualization, etc. And then when stuff happens when problems occur you need to come together in these war rooms and stare at our specialized monitoring and management tools and figure out what really was the root cause of the problem and quite often we descend to being human and find ourselves blaming each other for the problem as opposed to focusing on fixing it and then those very enviable upgrade cycles having to spend the weekend to very carefully take down parts of the infrastructure, run upgrades, bring them back up, and have this activity span across several weeks. And before you know it, three to five years have passed, and it's time to plan for data center refresh or expansion. It is no wonder that we, as members of the IT community, and parts of the IT infrastructure and operations organization find that we spend over 80% of our time in the infrastructure and only 20% on what our stakeholders, app owners, developers, customers, employees care about, which is applications. And we all understand why it is important to have the strong bedrock of infrastructure to run these applications and services upon. However, our stakeholders don't quite understand that. All they care about is the applications, data, and the services they access. In fact, we conducted a survey asking IT leaders across the globe, much like yourselves, um, asking them this specific question. Do application developers work with you when they need resources? And 57% of the respondents said that application developers constantly circumvent IT. IT is perceived as a retardant for innovation and not one that fosters innovation. And this is something we have to change. Now, we as members of the IT community are smart. We understand that it's infrastructure that's holding us back from being great. So as of 2016 or so, the move the consensus, rather, was to move to public cloud. And this immediately enables IT organizations to help their stakeholders deploy applications in minutes and basically get to market rapidly. It also enables them to pay for exactly what they need and not lock budget in three to five year buying cycles. There's also this perception of simple management and the infrastructure also gets better over time. You've got armies of engineers at the cloud vendor who is con that is constantly refreshing infrastructure, running upgrades on the IT organization's behalf. However, the public cloud is not suited for all types of workloads. Let's take, for instance, data gravity. There are petabytes of data that are being generated every single day by employees, sensors, customers, cameras, and it's impossible, if not cost prohibitive, to move all this data to a public cloud environment where the application can then process the data. Applications have to co-reside with data where it originates as opposed to the other way around. Second is this concern around regulations. GDPR in, the, in Europe and Certainly those regulations that restrict how we store and manage data 
impact us um, and our day-to-day -day lives as members of the IT organization. This restricts how we store data and where we store it. And this is where public cloud use cases may not address some of those regulatory concerns. Thirdly is this notion of loss of control. The public cloud is incredibly secure. However, it is still upon the customer, public cloud customer, to ensure that the data and applications are protected on top of the secure public cloud environment. And not being able to run your own tailored security solutions that restrict and prevent any threats from exploiting your data and applications could put customers at uh, a vulnerable state. And finally, the public cloud basically has limitless resources and it is very easy to undergo cost overruns when you make the public cloud available to the various parts of the organization in your company. And it's no wonder that cloud-based workloads are returning on premises for many of these reasons. IDC conducted a survey asking global IT leaders whether they planned to move applications back on premises, and if so, how many of those applications. And 85% of the respondents said that they intend to move over 50% of their applications that are cloud-based back on premises over two years. And let's not forget, four out of five workloads are still on premises, and we need a solution for these on premises workloads as well. So, in reality, what organizations really need is a balance between private cloud for those highly predictable, low latency, high performance applications that require greater control, and the public cloud, which is suited for cloud bursting, elastic workloads cloud-native workloads, and for those innovative projects that the developers spin up and uh, then begin to incubate before they are brought into the private cloud. Now, to accomplish this hybrid cloud strategy, the right to passage is private cloud. Organizations need to not just transform their technology, but also update their processes and skills to practice these processes within IT organizations. So you really need to achieve private cloud operation, operational excellence before you think about adopting hybrid cloud. So how do you go about bringing the cloud inside? First, it has to be incredibly easy, just like public cloud, to deploy, upgrade, expand non-disruptively, manage centrally, and still have it support all the multiple use cases, applications, and data needs that exist in the organization. Secondly, it has to be intelligent. It has to automate away all those mundane, repetitive, and daily tasks that happen and force your IT staff to focus upon uh, so that they can finally spend all their time delivering critical services and focusing on strategic initiatives. And thirdly, it has to be resilient. It has to be able to secure your applications and data from internal and external threats and also ensure that End users are not impacted by downtime by having strong business continuity measures in place. And this is what needs is needed to give you that peace of mind. So what we need to be really thinking about is when we think about building a private cloud is how do we align to business needs? How do we get closer to the business? And to do that, we need to be able to be agile and respond to business needs as and when they are required to do so without breaking the bank, and while ensuring that all pr promised SLAs are met. And to do that, we need to be able to arm our IT teams to be able to standardize upon simple and scalable infrastructure that can scale out as use cases, applications, and data grows, that enables them to consolidate critical data services upon this cloud-like platform so that they're able to expand with data growth while still service the multiple use cases, employees, and customers with data needs across the organization. Then they need to be able to really enable IT teams to be able to increase their productivity at increasing rates of quality. And this is only done through intelligent automation that is powered by machine learning, AI, and an ability to be able to put in place self-service experiences that enable IT to become a service organization. 
Once you have this, you need to be able to have a strong posture for business continuity. And this means that you need to be able to recover seamlessly when primary infrastructure goes down, and you need to be able to back up those most valuable applications and data for compliance reasons or for long-term retention or archival use cases. Then at every stage of this journey, you need to have a strong security posture and a strong posture of governance so you're able to identify which groups in the organization are consuming resources at what level so you can have better planning as a result of that. So the very first step in this journey is to be able to set that foundation to build that simple and scalable infrastructure. And here's what we are used to having today, this classic traditional infrastructure model where you have compute farms, storage networking, SANS, virtualization layers that sit on top of this infrastructure before you actually get to focus on those applications. Now, what we need to be able to do is consolidate all of this, this entire stack into a single form factor, which basically equates one unit of cloud that can run on a variety of hardware platforms. So it's decoupled, software defined, <clears throat> and runs on a variety of hardware platforms that are available in the market today. And this unit of cloud should be infinitely scalable as needs grow. It should also support a variety of virtualization and containerization technologies, right from ESXi, <clears throat> Hyper-V, Kubernetes, and also Nutanix is proud to provide AHV, which is a free-for-all free built-in virtualization capability. And then begin to absorb the management of virtualization alongside other elements of the infrastructure, be it compute storage or networking. Now, this cloud-like platform has to be easy to manage, just like the public cloud, from day zero to day n, and all from one single user interface. It should also be intelligent so that it places applications alongside the data that the application relies upon to increase efficiency, increase performance. And when there's resource contention in a specific node in the cluster, it should be able to migrate the application and data over to other nodes that have more resources to provide for it. And thirdly, it has to be resilient so that data is replicated in the smallest slices and distributed across nodes in the cluster. So in the event of a data loss, it's able to very quickly recreate that segment of data without choking the network or impacting the application performance and eventually resulting in poor customer experience. Once you have this, you then need to focus on what's most important to the organization, which is its data. Data monetization is a key topic these days. And to do that, you need, a very, you need to have a very data-centric architecture in place where data can be served programmatically or otherwise to various stakeholders or applications in the organization. To do that, you need to tear down those silos that exist between not just data and application, but within data silos as well. And data fragment is data fragmentation is a huge concern for organizations and would impact the organization's ability to be able to really put itself in a position to monetize its data. So to do that, Nutanix offers built-in data services across a variety of protocols, uh, whether it's iSCSI, NFS SMB, or S3 to support a variety of use cases. So take, for block, data, take block data, for example, to serve and, and support virtual machines and email systems and databases. Or file data, which is important for organizing um, user data through, um, whether it's for use, uh, departmental shares or for VDI use cases. And finally, object data, which is important for not just those DevOps use cases and developer productivity, but also to ensure that important information is being archived securely for uh, later retrieval. Now, all of this is as easy to scale and manage as the underlying cloud platform is. It scales non-disruptively, expands as data needs grow, and it's self-managed unlike traditional storage. 
Um, and finally, it also delivers key insights that you would need as members of the IT organization to be able to understand the nature of data that exists in uh, your infrastructure, in your environment, and also to be able to detect anomalous behavior that occurs when, relate, when it relates to your data. Next, you need to be able to enable members of the IT organization, system, system administrators, IT administrators, to be able to get done more, to increase their productivity. And this is what truly separates them from being infrastructure engineers to cloud engineers. With built-in machine learning and automation presented via a single web-based user interface, IT staff within your organization can reduce complex and repetitive tasks across the IT lifecycle to just a few clicks. They can deploy resources non-disruptively and scale their cloud during business hours. No longer do they have to work during weekends. They can manage and monitor servers, storage, and VMs from one place as opposed to multiple specialized tools. The system can also detect and automatically resolve anomalies in real time. There's no more need, uh, needless firefighting that's required in this, in this scenario. They can also perform upgrades from hardware to hypervisor with one click. This frees up weeks of careful planning and running of upgrades during off hours. Finally, you get an opportunity to use data and insights to plan for growth and for new projects. You no longer have to rely on Excel spreadsheets. The system uniquely understands how resources are consumed based upon existing workloads and users that are relying upon that environment. And this data then helps you with these planning processes. All this frees up maintenance time, ensures 25, 24 by seven performance and enables you to get ahead of the needs of the business. And that's what cloud experiences are all about. This transition empowers you to take a more service-oriented approach to IT. To effectively do so, you need to focus on reducing time taken to resolve requests while raising quality, and this can only be done through automation. With fully integrated self-service capabilities delivered by Calm, which is a part of the Nutanix cloud software, you can truly deliver IT as a service. You need to simply gather an inventory of the most commonly requested resources or applications and blueprint them and publish them onto an internal marketplace. Your stakeholders, whether they are business analysts or developers, can visit this app store and get what they need instantly. You can then free up time from having to manually service and close IT tickets while still ensuring and delivering instant gratification to your various stakeholders. You will still be able to retain control of the application instances that were deployed, which means that when a patch is released for a specific part of the application, you as the, uh, as, as the member of the IT organization can, organization can deploy these patches to ensure that your application is secure no matter what. And when those applications are no longer needed, you can retire those applications and release the resources back to the common pool. Now, as you're able to deliver applications and data services from your cloud, you need to be able to ensure that you have a reliable business continuity and disaster recovery practice in place that prevents disruption and data loss at all costs. And to do this, uh, our software delivers the only fully integrated services for DR and backup with the choice of deployment and software. So you can either choose to start up a secondary site where you can fail over to and fail back from and use automated recovery plans to do so, or you can choose to consume it as a service and this is Xyleap that's delivered as a service, a subscription service to our customers who would rather not dedicate infrastructure for a DR side. And for all those critical data and workloads, you can back it up onto an integrated best-in-class backup platform that's delivered by Nutanix, uh, which enables you to manage this infrastructure alongside your primary infrastructure while still using best-in-class backup software that suits your needs. And for all that data, 
that needs to be archived for long-term retention or for regulatory purposes, you can choose to do so using any S3 compliance services, including Nutanix objects. Finally, at every stage of the process, you, know, you need to be able to ensure a proper security posture. To do so, the software encrypts all data at rest and manages the keys required to access this data within the same environment. This helps you avoid having to actually purchase uh, separate key management software and integrate it into the system. Next, it secures the applications that access this data using micro-segmentation. And by creating wall gardens that prevent or control east-west traffic within your environment, you can begin to have strong security policies that protect your applications, not just from external threats, but also from threats that exist within your environment. And finally, it also secures your cloud through strong authentication and authorization practices by being able to periodically run compliance checks to ensure that you're always in compliance from a security perspective and uh, self-healing capabilities bring your environment back to compliance if there were deviations from it. The software also uh, supports a wide variety of uh, standards that exist in the industry and also supports a wide variety of uh, security solutions that exist in the market, be it across firewalls, malware, antivirus, encryption, key management, or micro-segmentation software. Finally, to truly become a cloud operator within your business, you need to be able to monitor, meter, and charge back actual costs, including usage and staff to appropriate business units and departments. With Beam, this is the only private cloud solution that delivers this capability as a service. So to summarize, these are the critical capabilities you need within your organization to be able to build your private cloud before you move on to achieving your hybrid cloud strategy. And we hope you choose Nutanix to take with you on this journey using the software that we've invested in to help our customers succeed. And you have our guarantee to have your backs at every stage of this journey. We serve uh, across you know, over 100 countries with over seven worldwide support centers. And our customer obsession shows in the 97% customer satisfaction score and a plus 90 net promoter score that we've held for over five years. And to prove to you that it delivers the value that you're looking for, IDC conducted an independent study and found that a Nutanix deployment lowers total cost of operations by over 60%, uh, leads to over 97% fewer unplanned outages, and has an incredibly short payback period of seven months. I'd like to thank you for your time and hope you were able to understand why you need private clouds as the first step towards achieving My hybrid clouds. from Krish at Nutanix. Thank you, Krish. Uh, I'm just going to bring up this poll question that says, what additional info would you like about the Nutanix solution? Uh, Krish is available to answer questions in the Q&A tab. If you have questions about Nutanix, uh, how, you know, you might get started or features that are available, you know, feel free to post those questions there in the tab. Uh, we are doing a lot of live Q&A today. We're going to just keep this event rolling, uh, one presentation after another uh, to, you know, just maximize your time and reduce the time of the or length of the event. So uh, thank you everyone for the common or uh, great comments coming in there in the chat box. Really appreciate those. And of course, always appreciate uh, tech questions there in the Q&A tab. So thank you for answering that poll. It's time for our next prize announcement. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Aaron Guzik from Illinois. Congratulations, Aaron Guzik from Illinois. And our next grand prize, another laptop going to Anthony Terry from California. Congratulations, Anthony Terry from California. We've got three more gift cards and three more grand prizes to give away. So make sure that you stay tuned for those. If you haven't answered the poll question, we encourage you to do that. And of course, we appreciate it. All right, thank you everyone. It's now time to get moving and go on to our next presentation. All right, it's now my pleasure to introduce 
Lindsay Bly, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Okta. Lindsay, take it away. And thank you for joining. I'm Lindsay Bly. I'm on the product marketing team here at Okta. And today we're going to talk about reducing AD dependency as you move to the cloud. So for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to cover a quick background on Active Directory and then dive into the typical journey that we see Okta customers take in their steps towards moving off of Active Directory and onto a modern IDAS platform. And then we'll try to save five minutes at the end for questions. So think of some good ones as we're going through this content. So to start out, uh, to give a little background on where Active Directory came from, it really originated, actually launched back in 1999. Yet, as many of you know, it still plays a major role in the majority of IT environments today. And the problem with that is, is Active Directory was actually built for how work was done back in the late 90s and early 2000s and not how we do work today. Now, I know uh, a lot of you out there probably weren't even in the workforce back in 99 or the early 2000s, so you don't really know what this might look like. And I went searching for the perfect artifact to demonstrate what the work environment looked like back in 1999. And I actually found the movie Office Space was also released in 1999. So we have this whole 90 minute, essentially documentary of what the office environment used to look like back then. And so I pulled this still, this is Peter Gibbons, he's the main character in Office Space. And I wanna point out a few things in this screenshot to help demonstrate what work looked like back in those days. And also keep in mind that these are some of the things that Active Directory was designed for. So the first thing is this big stack of papers. This is an indication that work was pretty much staying in the office. You weren't gonna lug your work home with you because you relied on resources that were kind of stuck in the office or pinned in the office, or you would bring them home in a big briefcase. But basically, all, a lot of the information that you needed was often physical or it was stored in a server that was only accessible from the office. The other artifact I want to point out is this desk phone. Now, these still exist today, but back in the day, a, a lot of people relied only on a desk phone, didn't have a smartphone. And when you think about this, this is a, a really big difference to how work is done today. This phone had no applications, it didn't house emails, it didn't have sensitive information, and it really couldn't be lost or stolen unless someone came into the office and unplugged it. And the last thing I want to point out in this picture is this desktop PC. So these were almost 100% likely to run Windows back in 99. And this computer, like that phone, is also not going anywhere. This means that Peter's not going to go work from home on his laptop. This computer will not make it into the Starbucks so that he'd be logging onto a public Wi-Fi network. Basically, when workers logged into their machines back when AD was created, it was assumed that they were logging into a secure network and they were logging into the latest and greatest on-premises apps that, that were out there. But of course, you guys all know this, the way that we work has changed drastically since then. I want to call out three major shifts that we see that, that essentially make AD a, a blocker to innovation and also an insecure way to enable your workforce. And the first major shift I want to talk about is the flexible work environment. So we're seeing a huge rise in virtual, remote, um, and contract workspaces. So it, it, people are no longer working solely in the office. A study done by Upwork even shows that nearly 70% of younger managers support some form of remote employees. And this is an indication that this trend is not going anywhere. In fact, we're seeing a lot more companies start to adopt this as a standard practice. The second big shift is the shift to heterogeneous and mobile devices. So we are no longer in a PC world. You all know this. You probably all have a smartphone that you work from constantly. Um, and these devices, they're also not only Windows. A lot of smartphones, the majority of them are iPhones, but you might have Android. You might be, your team might be working with Chromebooks. They might be working with MacBooks, not just Windows devices. So increasingly IT needs to support a broadening array, a broadening array of devices out there and not just Windows. And what makes this a little bit more complicated is organizations or employees without the organization's consent are often starting to bring their own devices into the work environment. And this means that unsuspecting organizations can't necessarily control what those users are accessing from their own personal devices. And then lastly, cloud adoption. So the majority of organizations today are taking at least some steps into a cloud journey. And this new delivery model is, is really, really great because it allows organizations to choose the applications that work best for their needs and not necessarily be 
beholden to a single vendor and a single stack. But what this means is we're starting to see some application proliferation. There might be hundreds uh, of applications that exist within an organization now because they're so easy to set up and deploy. In fact, on average, the, the average large enterprise has around 329 applications. Um, and this also introduces not only a burden for IT, but additional new forms of security threats that IT has to be aware of. And the challenge with these new big shifts is that Active Directory was never built to support these modern needs of an organization. Remember, it was built back in 1999. And thinking back to that office space, still a lot has changed. And this means that Active Directory has a difficulty in adopting these new modes of working. It has little support for new technology like mobile devices, for example, or best of breed applications. And, and it doesn't adapt well to secure an increasingly complex environment that might on one hand have a bunch of legacy technology in it, and then on the other hand have some of the most cutting edge innovative technology out there. And what this does is create constraints in your organization that force you to choose certain technology or force your teams to work in a certain way. And essentially it makes employees less productive in organizations less secure. And this is why at Okta, we envision a future of secure, efficient, and modern IT. And at its core, what we really mean is we envision a directory that enables organizations to select the best tools and the best work environments for their employees, essentially creating happy and productive employees across the organization. And at the same time, these tools should be, the, this modern identity provider should also be able to secure both legacy technology and new innovations while not being a burden for IT to manage. Now, putting that into practice, let's talk a little bit about what yesterday, yesterday's directory looked like compared to the directory of the future or what we're seeing in IDAS providers today. And so the directory of yesterday required a bunch of manual overhead to manage. It required full IT teams just to support a deployment of Active Directory. Information is housed in silos. AD is notorious for creating multiple forests and multiple domains that make it a headache and a security risk for IT teams to manage. These legacy directories like Active Directory uh, also bias organizations into selecting tools from that same vendor. So in the case of Active Directory, Active Directory was designed to bias you towards tools that were built by Microsoft and purchased solely from that stack. And this often means that organizations are choosing tools because they're in that vendor suite and not because they're solving the problems that they specifically have. These legacy identity providers also encourage risky behavior like shared accounts and entitlements because they aren't flexible enough to, to handle uh, varying and dynamic identity needs. And then lastly, of course, because these directories are on-prem, there's a heavy maintenance cost that comes associated with, to deploy, with deploying and maintaining them. So let's talk about the directory of tomorrow. Uh, and, and when we think about this at Okta, we're talking about the modern identity as a service provider. And what we think this will look like and what we're working towards uh, is instead of manual operations, automating as much as you possibly can within and from your directory that will essentially allow you to free up your IT teams to focus on strategic projects and really improving the organization instead of getting their hands all tied up within managing a directory. The Director of the Future, we believe, will connect information silos to essentially enable a single source of truth, regardless of where they're pulling the information from. It will also support a best-of-breed strategy when it comes to se selecting resources and applications. And instead of shared accounts and entitlements, all identity should be context-specific so that the right users are accessing the right applications for the right reasons, and no one has to actually share accounts or share entitlements to get access to the things they need to do their work. And then lastly, of course, we're talking about an identity as a service solution. So, of course, it will be SaaS based, meaning all of those server costs and the cost of maintaining on-prem environments are no longer there. And what this directory of the future translates to is, is better support not only for the technology of today, but also for the technology of the future. And it allows IT teams to have improved visibility and management capabilities that essentially enable them to deploy new technologies faster. And overall, it improves the security posture that really adapts to the modern ways that, that we're working today and provides a platform where you can adapt to modern ways, maybe for uh, modes of work that we haven't even thought of in the future. Now, of course, adopting an IDAS solution doesn't happen overnight, and that requires, of course, a movement off of Active Directory. 
Um, and this is not an overnight process, as I just mentioned. This is a major, major journey for a lot of customers that we work with. Luckily, Okta has worked with thousands of customers in their IT modernization journey that involves reducing the reliance on Active Directory. Now, of course, this journey will vary a ton based on a number of variables, including the size of your company, the complexity of your Active Directory, and essentially what your end goal is. Maybe you never actually need to get rid of Active Directory. You just want to minimize your usage. But with working with thousands of customers on this, we've kind of identified four different phases that are representative of what customers typically go through. And that's the first phase, evaluating the status quo, so what exists today. The second phase is extending Active Directory with a modern SSO solution. Third is establishing, establishing an identity as a service hub. And then lastly is building a secure identity cloud. Now, in the next few minutes here, I'm going to walk through each of these phases in detail for you and give you a better idea of what's actually occurring at each phase. So starting with the first phase, I want to orient you a little bit on this before we dive in. Um, you're looking at somewhat of a complex architecture diagram, but it's, it's pretty simple here. Of course, the triangles in the middle are the active directories, and then the boxes that are red, green, or yellow are specific use cases or resources, and the color is an indication of how well that use case or resource is covered in each scenario. And now what you might notice when you look at that at this architecture diagram at first is there's a number of Active Directory forests or domains um, that are in this architecture diagram. And this is super, super common, especially in large enterprises that often grew through acquisition. And this really does, though, pose a challenge for IT. They have to manage the trust relationships between these domains, and this creates a broadening surface area for attack and essentially more security risk for an organization. So if we actually look at what AD is doing well in this picture, though, if we take a look at the green, well, of course, it's, it's doing well what it's always done since the 2000s. And that's really managing Windows devices, printers, and Windows servers. It's doing an okay job at managing employees and on-prem apps because those were some of the initial use cases that were actually relevant back in the late 90s. But even these resources and use cases have evolved over time. So let's talk about some of the risks that are relevant to this model. So highlighting on the right here, of course, there's there's a bunch going on when Active Directory is your only form of identity provider. Um, again, because it, it, it is so antiquated and it doesn't adapt to the needs of the organization today, there's a lot going on here. Um, to walk through these at a, at a pretty high level, the first risk I want to call out is application security. Now we have on-prem apps in orange, but we know the majority of organizations are adopting some sort of cloud application technology for their employee base today. And in this model, those SaaS applications are not covered. And in this model, those on-prem applications are likely using old standards for security and assuming that just because they're surrounded by the network that they're safe. This also unfortunately translates to a poor user experience. So when you think of organizations that are in hybrid mode where they have a number of on-prem apps, they have a number of cloud applications, users need to access those applications every day to do their jobs. But when they have to go to different pages to log into those apps or access those applications, they have to remember hundreds of different credentials and where to go for what. It creates a burden on users uh, to actually locate the right information and figure out how to access it. In this model, IT automation is also somewhat not well covered, too. So we know a lot of organizations will create PowerShell scripts to create automations like provisioning from HR into AD or automating some of the processes between active directories. But these PowerShell scripts are custom code, and essentially it's really difficult to adopt these as fast as your business is changing. And oftentimes they can be ignored or just layered on top of. The next bullet here is extended enterprise. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that contractors and partners are in red, and this is what we call the extended enterprise. And now when you're working with just Active Directory, there's a number of risks associated with putting these non-employee users into your main identity provider, um, specifically that you're giving them access essentially to way more than they need. In this model, they would get access to that broad surface area of all of those Active Directory domains. In fact, most organizations that, that we work with um, typically don't put users into Active Directory, and they're either managing them, them manually or with a separate system. In this model, too, uh, 
devices are not well covered. So we talked a little bit about how Windows devices are in green. So things like PCs and um, a little bit of legacy technology, but what's not covered are the non-Windows devices that are increasingly more popular. So Macs, Chromebooks, and also mobile devices are not covered in these scenarios. And anything unmanaged, Active Directory has no visibility into. And then lastly, outside of Windows servers, there's no coverage for infrastructure or modern development methods that are taking hold in a lot of organizations today. So the first thing that we typically see organizations do is extend Active Directory with a cloud-based SSO solution. And the reality is that most organizations today, again, to some extent are moving to the cloud. Active Directory is using legacy protocols to manage access and it doesn't adopt to the modern standards like SAML or OIDC that cloud apps require. Um, and at the same time, as the cloud, as the network perimeter disappears with the onset of cloud applications, um, there, there are new modes of security that need to be in place to protect the organization. And so this phase is all about layering in an identity as a service provider to support SSO for both on-prem and cloud applications and a multi-factor authentication um, for both types of applications as well. And when organizations are able to do that, it enables them to really securely adopt new technology. So to continue to adopt those forward thinking cloud applications that are out there, that best of breed technology their employees demand, while at the same time securing access to critical on-prem systems that might be sticking around for a few more years. And they're able to overlay this with a seamless user experience so their employees can access everything from a single dashboard, regardless of if it's on-prem or a cloud application, and adaptive MFA policies that balance user usability and security across all types of applications. Now, this next phase that we see organizations go through is what we're calling establishing an identity hub. And there's, there's a lot going on here, but I want to call out a few key things. In this phase, organizations are typically using an IDAS, in, in this case, Okta Universal Directory, to manage the extended enterprise users that I mentioned before that were previously uncovered, and also um, support more of the complex use cases that come along with uh, contractor needs and partner relationships. In this phase, you'll also notice that we went from four Active Directory domains down to one. Um, so organizations will often consolidate domains or use Active Directory to kind of serve as a single source of truth across Active Directory domains so that they're able to gain visibility and control over what is happening downstream of Okta. You'll also notice at the top here that this is when organizations often choose to leverage a MDM or a UEM provider um, to help manage some of those devices that aren't traditional PCs. Now we often see Intune, which is a Microsoft product, or Mobile Iron, or Workspace ONE. All of those companies do a great job at helping to manage the devices that were previously unmanaged or housed in AD. And they also support bring your own device policies, allowing employees to select the device that they're using. And at this phase, we also often see IT teams starting to build out some of the automations um, in their IDAS solution that were previously really difficult to maintain on-prem. And this is typically using some of the pre-built connectors. So Okta has around uh, 6,000 integrations, and we make it super, super easy for organizations to connect to applications and even automate processes like provisioning, deprovisioning, self-service password reset to really remove that burden of um, application management from IT. And of course, when we look at this, it, it looks pretty good, but there's one last risk over on our little red side, and that's infrastructure. So when we get to this final phase, it's all about establishing a secure identity cloud. And this is really going beyond um, standard users and applications and identity to securing infrastructure that was previously unsupported by Active Directory. So we've talked about how Active Directory has done a decent job at managing Windows servers. And if you actually look at this diagram, you'll see that we've actually left Active Directory in there to manage Windows servers. But organizations often have more than just Windows. They're often running Linux, Linux servers as well. And those are a total, totally different beast to manage. SCCM does not do quite as good of a job as managing and automating some of those processes around those servers. And so what we see these organizations do is start to move some of that server management under their IDAS provider as well and have a modern way to automate and secure access to uh, the increasing amount of servers that they have to manage. And infrastructure doesn't stop just at servers. It goes beyond servers to, to really think about um, 
some of the new and modern development methods like APIs and microservices that have similar access and security requirements. And we're seeing organizations increasingly also putting these under the umbrella of IDAS to help manage access and security. And one last call out I want to mention here too is that you'll notice that Active Directory is still in the picture in this diagram. Now, some organizations may choose to get rid of it entirely. Um, other organizations may choose to keep it around for whatever reason. Some of the common reasons that we see people keep it are to manage file shares from way back in the day that no one wants to dig through and sift out and find, find out what's important or to manage um, a number of printers or legacy technology. But what I think is really, really important when you even though active directory is still around in a lot of these scenarios all of the 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 majority of your employee facing processes your contractor your customer facing processes are now managed out of a modern IDAS solution so that your employees you know that they're able to be more productive they can use the latest technology they can adopt best of breed technology if they want to and they're not marred by having to search for where was it that that application that I logged into 15 years ago? They can access both of their new and legacy technology through a single dashboard. And at the same time, you as an IT organization can be sure that you're applying modern security processes and, and uh, policies to all of your technology as well. And this is kind of where, where our journey ends here, but I want to reiterate that this is a journey, this, this movement off of Active Directory. And again, it's going to vary for everyone depending on your organization, your existing architecture, where you want to go and where some of the major pain points are. Um, I encourage you, we have a number of resources available to get you to start thinking about what you might want to do in terms of Active Directory available on okta.com slash rethink AD. We have a really great ebook there that can go into some more detail about some of the, the supporting solutions that can help you move off of Active Directory and specifically how Okta can solve some of those major use cases out there. And with that, um, thank you all for joining me. I want to leave some time for questions, uh, and I will pull them from the stream now. Looks like we have time for about uh, two to three questions here. Um, so I'm going to pull some questions coming in from the stream. The first one is a question that we hear a lot when we start to think about rethinking Active Directory, and that is, uh, my organization has been using Active Directory for years, and as a result, we have... Uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of GPOs in place. What do I do with these when I move out of Active Directory? So we commonly see organizations as they go on this journey um, start to move their GPOs from Active Directory into their device management solution um, of their choosing, whether that's Intune or VMware AirWatch. They'll move those uh, group policy group policies out of Active Directory and into that new solution that is in the cloud. Um, if you decide to um, keep your devices in Active Directory for a while and layer in an IDAS solution on top of that, you can also keep your GPOs within Active Directory and integrate those with your IDAS provider like, like Okta. And other other organizations, and this is you know for for relatively new organizations or organizations that have a super simple Active Directory structure, Okta and other IDAS providers do typically have uh, some sort of group capabilities within them. So newer organizations that are just starting out and they're starting out in the cloud without a legacy Active Directory footprint, they can typically manage um, group things like security policies within those IDAS providers. All right, second question. Um, let's see here. So our organization still has custom on-prem applications that we will be moving to the cloud for at least the foreseeable future. How will these be managed outside of Active Directory? So I mentioned, and it was pretty quick, so you might have missed it, but in the first phase, we talked about layering in SSO on top of Active Directory. And you should really look for an SSO provider like Okta that provides SSO and MFA for both on-prem apps and cloud applications um, that's still a, a provider base in the cloud. And so Okta recently launched a product called Okta Access Gateway, which essentially delivers Okta SSO and adaptive MFA to header-based or Kerberos-based applications that are on-premises. And this doesn't require a change in legacy app code to work um, with the cloud standards that we see today, like SAML or OIDC. And instead, it allows you to essentially re reduce your server infrastructure, move the management of those applications to the cloud and mitigate, help mitigate risk with some of those deprecated identity solutions on-prem. Um, 
And this is really great from a, an end user experience too, because everything can be housed in a single dashboard and, and your end users don't have to go searching for, you know, that one financial system that is still on-prem when 90% of the applications they work with on a day-to-day -day basis are in the cloud. If you want to learn more about the OctAccess Gateway and how you could uh, actually use that um, that functionality to manage on-prem apps, you can definitely check out our, the Okta product page for Access Gateway. If you just check out our website and uh, under products, check out Okta Access Gateway. And we have a webinar coming up with our um, our product man or our product marketing manager Federico, who is an Okta Access Gateway expert. Uh, that I think is in mid January. And if you go to Okta.com/resources/events. Uh, you can find that webinar there and attend that to get some more details on the solution, which specific types of applications are covered. All right, and lastly, uh, we're already an Okta customer and are planning on moving off of Active Directory. How long does this typically take? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for being a customer. We appreciate that. And the answer to that is it, it really depends on a number of variables. Uh, newer organizations that are primarily cloud are going to have a much easier time at moving off of Active Directory than organizations that have had AD ingrained in their business for 20 years and have grown through a mess of acquisitions where everything's kind of cobbled together. Um, for a lot of IT departments, even just figuring out the dependencies uh, that are driven off of Active Directory can be a huge challenge. So. Of course, the answer is it varies. You know, we've, and of course, it's a journey as we walked through today. So what I what I would suggest doing, um, is kind of taking an inventory. So starting with an inventory and really figuring out what is everything that's touching Active Directory, and what is Active Directory actually driving in those applications and those resources. And I think from there you'll be able to get a better picture of how long it's actually going to take you to move off of this, those things. I would uh, I would hate to say that it'll take a year or a couple years just not knowing your environment. But again, I would I would start inventorying everything you have. Our customers that have kind of deliberately taken a, a journey to move off of Active Directory typically start with some sort of inventory and prioritization process. And when it uh, when it comes to prioritization, you know, we talk through a number of resources and applications and user types that you can start thinking about moving off of Active Directory. And I would really think through what's causing you the most pain um, from an IT standpoint or from an end user standpoint and or what's creating the most security risk for your organization and start thinking through how you can get those really high priority items off of Active Directory as quickly as possible um, before really starting to move into some of the lower priority things that are still kind of lingering in there. All right, and it looks like we're actually right at, at time here. So thank you all again for joining us. I encourage you to check out octa.com slash rethinkad for some more resources on this. And definitely if you're interested in Okta Access Gateway, check out that webinar. That link is octa.com slash resources slash events. It should be a really great resource for people who still have a number of on-prem apps that they're looking to cover with an IDAS provider. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you listening and good luck in your journey moving off of Active Directory. Great presentation, Lindsay. Thank you very much. Uh, we got a lot of good questions coming in for Okta. Um, I have brought up this poll question that's on the screen. What additional info would you like about, about the Okta solution? Uh, I know I had at least a couple people say that they'd like to speak directly to Okta and try the solution out for themselves. So feel free to indicate that here on this as well. Um, great feedback from Justin, a very good presenter. I agree, uh, lots of good feedback for uh, Lindsay from Okta. Uh, thank you, everyone. So I'm just going to leave up this slide while we announce our next set of prize winners. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Steve Learfeld, Learfeld from New Jersey. Congratulations, Steve Learfeld from New Jersey. And our next laptop is going to Matthew Tekin, or Tekin from Massachusetts. Congratulations, Matthew Tekin from Massachusetts. A lot more prizes to give away, so make sure you stay tuned. Uh, appreciate uh, everyone answering the poll question. But it's now time to get on to our next presentation. All right, it's my pleasure now to introduce Sasha Dawes, Senior Director of Product Marketing, and Thomas LaRock, Head Geek at SolarWinds. 
Sasha and Thomas, are you there? Yes, we are, and thanks for uh, introducing us. Awesome. Thanks for being on. Take it away. Fantastic. Tom, I, li I like your title better. It's a lot easier to pronounce. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, today uh, we're going to talk to you about uh, kind of monitoring and management of uh, your next-gen IT environment. So, uh, you know, we, we at SolarWinds have a uh, pretty comprehensive uh, portfolio of solutions that really help you monitor, manage, and secure your IT environment, especially as it expands. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing, and, and uh, hopefully that maps to uh, what you're experiencing as well. So um, here's, oh, we have a building slide. It's just a little bit about myself, but more interestingly about Thomas. Um, but, uh, oh, I went a little too quickly there. Um, I have to build hey, it out again. I have to build it out know, again. I know. Sorry. Uh, out, of, out of practice on this one. Um, but, uh, yeah, Thomas, the, uh, the, the good-looking guy on the bottom. I'm, well, anyway, I'm the guy on the top. But uh, anyway, we'll be talking to you and, and uh, just in the next 20 or so minutes. So. It says you're from the UK. I would have never guessed. Uh, yes, the accent comes and goes depending upon the, uh, the, the weather, so, uh, which we, we talk a lot about in the UK. Anyway, just uh, a little bit about our agenda. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the challenges of adopting and using public cloud, and not just public cloud, but all clouds. One of the things that uh, many of you are using today, and we're talking about you know, moving into the next gen IT environment. Uh, is, uh, um, is, is all about uh, you know, how organizations are expanding, what we're seeing, what the industry is seeing. It's not about keeping all your content on-premises. We've got organizations that are really starting to leverage the cloud. And we'll talk about the, uh, the steps to bridge that journey to public cloud. So whether you're just starting your journey or whether you're already out there, then really uh, we'll talk about some of the best practices that, uh, that we've seen and that we actually implement. And then obviously we'll, we'll tie it back to uh, what we can help, or how we can help you with our uh, products for multi-cloud and, and hybrid environments with our IT operations management portfolio. So just uh, some, some of the, the, the things that uh, we see taking place across uh, you know, the, the industry worldwide. So no surprise, digital transformation. Uh, I think that's uh, you know, a very popular term at the moment, Tom. I, I guess you, you hear quite a bit about that one, right? Yes, I do hear that uh, quite a bit, that term. Uh, for me, being a data guy, I don't think there's anything new that's happening these days, but there's always yeah. somebody that wants to put a marketing term on things that have been happening. It, exactly, yes. We like to leverage those, those, those product marketing guys, right? Yeah. Um, so digital transformation, very popular. I can't think it tends to be used more of journey to cloud or leveraging cloud assets, but in reality, it's the fact that you know, most uh, IT appli well, applications um, and business processes are mapped into some form of IT application or some, it's been digitized, moving away from uh, pen and paper. MSP adoption, you know, we, we see a lot of, especially smaller, but increasingly larger companies going to MSPs to help them with their IT management, and, and you know, many of those, we'll, we'll talk about some of the challenges in a, in a few slides, but you know, with lack of IT staff, which willing to, willingness and openness to use budget in different ways, then clearly, uh, you know, especially in the small to medium business, we're seeing high adoption of MSP, but uh, in the compliance space as well, that's another area that people outsource. Hybrid IT, uh, we'll cover that as well, but uh, it, it's really that mapping across one or multiple uh, environments. So you may have your continue to use your on-premises environments uh, and then starting to use one or more cloud environments. Or if you started in the cloud, you may be using multiple cloud environments inside your environment. Ultimately, you know, just th these are just some of the key things that we're seeing that are really driving changes and disruption in the market. And, you know, we, we've been around for, you know, quite some years now and really, uh, you know, continuing our IT operations management capabilities but extending those capabilities into these hybrid and multi-cloud environments to help uh, our customers and uh, you know, people who wish to be work with us to uh, really extend their ability to monitor, manage, and secure their environments and operations wherever they actually have IT assets and data deployed. And this, uh, this, this chart really shows the fact that you know, a lot of people talk about the growing adoption and the, the, the focus on public cloud. And I think the key thing to remember, though, is that there's ongoing focus on on-premises and private cloud spend as well. It's the fact that, you know, that there was a, a lot of misconceptions, say, about 10 years ago when public cloud really started to come to the fore, that everyone was going to move 100% to public cloud. 
Um, but the fact is that you know many organizations, some have moved to public cloud and moved back on-premises, uh, but many organizations have stayed on-premises and then they've started to, to reach out into public cloud environments. And we're seeing that huge growth. And I, I, I think today, I mean, talking, talking with uh, some of our customers, with some industry advocates and influencers, even talking with our colleagues at Microsoft, for example, you know, even they said that the, the main, only now is the mainstream starting to move out into, uh, into public cloud. So we can say that the past five to 10 years have been very much the early adopter, uh, and that's where we're seeing a lot of that movement. And you can kind of see some of those uh, you know, reasons behind that shift on the left-hand side. So cloud adoption, it's still a top priority for many organizations. We've mentioned that word digital transformation. Uh, but again, it, it's you know people are continuing to figure out okay how can we move faster how can we leverage some of these uh, these new uh, environments leverage the cloud uh, we've seen obviously a huge growth in DevOps and Agile as well I mean Tom what have you seen in this space Well uh, what I wanted to make note of here is uh, I, I think the numbers that we hear is that roughly 80% of workloads are still Earth. You know, there's a lot of opportunity out there for workloads to still move and migrate towards the cloud, whether it be AWS or Azure. Uh, so we can talk about that digital transformation and, and use all those buzzwords, but the reality is, like you said, there's a lot of early adopters out there that have tested the waters, they've built something, it's kind of cool, and now they've tossed it over the wall to the operations folks. And so there's a, a, a huge volume of workloads and data yet to migrate to the cloud. And I think that's why you're seeing, you know, this upward trend in spending, which will continue for the foreseeable future. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's like you said, I think uh, previously your development teams or, or those teams, like and sometimes business units, like finance or especially marketing, those marketers, again, would, would create these applications in the cloud because they didn't have the time to wait for you know, device, uh, like hardware to be procured, they wanted to get up and running as fast as possible, then all of a sudden, like you said, that application becomes sticky and, and they want, okay, we need someone to monitor and manage it 24 by 7. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that whole shadow IT thing and, and we, what we see a lot more these days is the, the DevOps teams or the, the modern application teams working a lot closer with their IT departments to figure out what are the tools we want to choose uh, in order to be able to successfully monitor and manage the environment, but also with compliance being such a, a big factor in today's environments, you know, how do we make sure that we're running in the best way to you know, ensure that we're meeting the requirements that are set down by different regulations or standards out there? So anyway, ongoing uh, change, but this, this just gives you a quick idea of, of the, the larger scale of where people are making their investments. And, and clearly, the, the, the thing to take away here is that on-premises is certainly uh, going to be continued to be invested in, um, but as I said, many organizations are moving out to uh, public cloud. Interestingly, and I'll, I'll just build this one out, uh, you know, we're seeing that increasing adoption of cloud, not just public cloud, but private cloud as well, and, and this is just uh, some interesting uh, facts that uh, I got from the, the Right Scale uh, 2019 report. Uh, but you can kind of see here, 91% of organizations are using public cloud in some fashion. Uh, Microsoft, Azure, and AWS, they're the two top public cloud vendors. Google is in third spot. Now they're in quite a, a distant third place. Um, but, you know, AWS, still pretty much the, uh, the predominant uh, public cloud vendor in the market. Microsoft catching up very quickly, uh, and you can kind of see some of those stats out there. Interestingly enough, uh, you know, it used to be organizations leveraged at least three clouds, and it's gone up to, on, on average, about five clouds. I think it's 4.9 as RightScale actually pointed out, but you know, it's, I think that's echoing the fact that people are different, using different cloud environments for different purposes. Absolutely. So they may go out to AWS, very popular in the, in the DevOps crowd. Um, Microsoft has been making some significant investments there as well, especially with their developer audience and their uh, organizational with Office 365 and, and leveraging the licensing. Google is, is very popular for some of the al analytics capabilities that they provide as well. So, you know, people are leveraging the cloud based on their needs. Um, and again, it's not just one organization, it's multiple teams within an organization that are starting to use these uh, different environments. Yeah, and don't forget, even these days you have a big push by, say, Oracle. 
to use the Oracle Cloud yeah. and get your database workloads into their cloud. So, because you sit here and you say five clouds on average, I'm like, I can't name five clouds, but I, actually I can. Yeah. Right? So AWS, Azure, uh, you'll mention Google, but you forgot Alibaba, which I think is actually third. And then there's, but there's uh, IBM, there's Oracle. Mm -hmm. So that's six right there. So you just find that in any environment and enterprise of a reasonable size, you'd probably be surprised to learn that there's a little bit of each somewhere in there. Right. Say so you might be using Gmail or just at least mm -hmm. Google Docs or maybe you're using storage in AWS because S3 buckets are just really easy to leave unsecured so your data goes everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's an increasing adoption and there's a lot of different driving factors for that. You know, you might be moving all your CRM to Salesforce. Well, that's just the cloud. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's not to forget there's private clouds as well. So you may be working with hosters. You may be running your own private yeah. cloud on premises. Or, so that comes into the mix as well. Or perhaps an MSP provider. Quite possibly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, um, you know, some some definitely an interesting report to read if you if you have the time. But some some key uh, key ob observations and takeaways from that. That said, I mean, the, the challenges that uh, face. You know, our customers and many of you really haven't changed in the past, you know, again, five to ten years. And I keep using that because that, that's pretty much when a lot of public cloud and AWS really started to come to the fore. And, of course, it's become a, a, a busier place for, uh, for cloud solutions. And, you know, it's, especially as you look to expand or maybe you, you have expanded your uh, next-gen IT environment, um, many of these probably uh, are still very familiar. So increased complexity is the fact that, again, you're still dealing with multiple vendors. You, you've got to figure out how do I put the different controls in place, and we'll talk about some of those in, in just a few minutes. Um, lack of visibility into what's going on. Uh, you know, we, we've seen the word you know, av monitoring availability and performance. Maybe some people use the word observability. But again, it's all about knowing, hey, what's going on inside the environment. Um, and that, you know, IT skills gaps. You've got new technologies. You've got to either bring people on to manage those. You've got to train them on, on those new technologies. Uh, the, 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 uh, the vendors out there keep changing their technology. You know, perfect example, AWS and, and, uh, and Microsoft uh, Azure. I mean, if you think about it, the number of times they've come out with new services or changed the controls that are available mm -hmm. or even changed the UI. I mean, it always used to drive me nuts when I get a new version of PowerPoint. It's like, well, how do I get to the animations pane? But then if you look at, uh, you look at the public cloud and even some of the private cloud technologies, things change. The UI changes. Some of the controls change. How do you keep on top of that? You've got to keep people trained, and they need to understand how to apply that. Uh, those uh, scary words, auditors, regulations, compliance, uh, you know, again, how do you keep on top of that successfully? Um, and the list goes on, but this, this is just a, a sample of some of the key ones that pop up uh, so quite frequently. I think another driver there, though, is also just keeping up with the competition. Mm -hmm. If you have another company that you know has, say, you know, uh, adopted some sort of cloud or, or just moved in that direction, you feel that might be necessary in order to keep up. You don't want to fall too far behind. So you sit there and say, well, we've got to do this. And somebody might say, well, should we take a minute to think about, say, compliance or security? No, 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 no. Just get it done. Right. And then that becomes a challenge because then you adopt something that might be hybrid or cloud, and then you realize all the pieces aren't there. And now you have to think about undoing the work you've done. Yeah, exactly. There are a lot, a lot of things, a lot of challenges that uh, you know, organizations today really face. Um, you know, and again, People will continue to try and improve in these areas, but as long as we have different vendors in the space, I mean, it's really hard. How do you get a common picture of what's going on and, and try and reduce some of the, the, the overhead associated with that? So what we're going to talk about briefly is, is just what we see as kind of four key steps to help bridge that journey to public cloud. And we just say to the journey to cloud. Uh, I mentioned some of the aspects mapped to private cloud as well. but. Uh, you know, the, these can apply whether you are a uh, someone who's new to cloud environments or really just starting to extend your on-premises environments into uh, into cloud, or whether you've been there for some time. So, you know, it, it's the usual thing of, hey, how often do you go back and reevaluate some of the things you've done in the past? Because again, more technology, better capabilities. Um, you know, as things evolve, uh, there may be things that you can leverage to further, you know, drive improved efficiencies across your organization. So we'll just go through some of these, but uh, let's just dig into the first one. So establishing fundamental controls, monitoring, spend, and securing access. Uh, you know, and, uh, if you think about it, these are two of the, the 
the core fundamental things you, you really need to worry about, especially when you go into public cloud. Because the fact is that if you think about cost, uh, public cloud vendors are it's, a, it's like a utility. They're charging you for what you use. And many of you probably worked, or many, many of you may be developers yourselves. And you know, how many of us have gone out there and said, I don't exactly know what I need, so I'm going to over-provision, or I end up over-provisioning what I need. Um, but it's like, how many of us really go back and do housekeeping after the fact? Okay, I've tested something out, but do I go back and actually turn off the machine? I think in, a, in an on-premises world, you're limited by capacity of your private cloud or on-premises resources. And at some point, someone's going to come and yell at you because they're out of space and they need to do some cleanup. You don't have that in public cloud. You've got effectively unlimited resources at your disposal. And so many people do spin up you know, one, ten, sometimes hundreds of machines and forget about it. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is that you, because it's got bills in arrears, you get this huge bill at the end of the day. It says, oh, I forgot to turn those off. I should have turned those off. And you know, this is something that's uh, really important to try and keep a good uh, handle on into what's going on there. Yeah, it, so if I compare this type of spending, I always say a cloud is nothing more than the new electric company. It's a utility like anything else. But if you think about, say, your gas and or your electric bill, you don't get details to tell you like you spent, your stove cost you X number of dollars this year. Or with your electric bill, the TV was this much and your server in the basement was this much. You really, Unless you've got a lot of, say, uh, smart plugs in play, you don't really have an idea of the actual usage in your house broken down. And a lot of the cloud spend is the same way. You get this bill at the end of the month, and they might break it down. But like you mentioned, it'd be broken down, and you might see that there's 17 VMs, say, but yeah. you don't actually know if you need all 17, because this is what we talk about, sprawl. So you need to have an idea of... Uh, so not just monitor the spend and securing access, but understanding, like how you even got to where you are, was mm -hmm. it necessary? Is it, and then, then we, of course, we could, I could spend all day saying, so that database costs you X number of dollars, but that might have been one query, yep. or it could have been all the queries. Like, you, you want to have that level of detail if possible. Yeah. The other key aspect or key fundamental is security. So, you know, we've all heard horror stories of people in the cloud, they forgot to say the, set the uh, access controls on the storage, mm -hmm. um, who has access to your environment if someone leaves the organization, uh, have you, uh, you know, securely deprovision them? Uh, mm -hmm. Are you, you know, taking as much care of, of credentials in a public cloud environment as you do in an on-premises environment? Again, you know, some developers hard code their uh, their access credentials into their code. They load it up onto GitHub, and then all of a sudden, it's surprising. What? Someone's got access to their subscription or their AWS account, and bad things are happening. So again, two key things that uh, you know you really need to to pay attention to in those cloud environments. Oh, that never happens. <laughs> or it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, second one is, you know, a lot of uh, organizations are still focusing on lift and shift as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is one, it's, it's good practice where, again, you're just doing virtualization on premises, or if you're looking to move things into cloud, thinking about the fact that you're gonna pay for what you use. And so it's really about how you're gonna optimize, how you're gonna improve your status before you move them into the cloud. And it's all about identifying over-provisioned resources. We talked about that one just a, a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Same time, under-provisioned resources. That's going to help you regardless. Um, and then at the same time, you know, forgotten VMs. That's another you know, key one, is that uh, if the person moving the assets into a cloud environment has no idea what a VM is for, they're un unlikely to turn it off or mm -hmm. even question it because that may create a lot more noise than they want, so they're just going to move it out there. Right. And so you end up, again, paying for more resources than you, you really need. Now, of course, once you've got all your content or all your assets and resources up in the cloud, we go back to the point of you know, observability is, is the popular mm -hmm. term today. It's, it's all about being able to monitor and manage what's going on. And so it's the fact that you know today, in the same way that a lot of organizations have bought best of breed tools to monitor their on-premises resources, they're leveraging other tools to do it. It's tools. It's tool sprawl. It is. Um, uh, and the fact is that you know there's very little integration between those tools, and so the fact is that if you think about just the public cloud basic monitoring capabilities, they are pretty limited. They're typically limited to that cloud environment, and they may only go down to specific uh, kind of components like hey, CPU, memory, and so on and so forth. 
there are different ways to, to pull things together. I would say that the, the API the APIs that are available to monitor assets on public clouds are fantastic, but of course then you need to be a developer to really understand and, and know how to leverage those. And of course those products or those, those environments do provide uh, you know, additional capabilities, but again, you typically have to pay for them on top of your, you know, what you're using. Um, in fact, you know, we've seen data out there that, that advertises that not many uh, IT or IT vendors or IT monitoring vendors actually have in their roadmap to extend out monitoring into those cloud environments. And that's one area that we really focus a lot with SolarWinds is making sure that we have extended the capabilities. I mean, we started off as an on-premises uh, IT infrastructure and application management vendor, but we've extended those capabilities out into hybrid and multi-cloud environments, and we'll get into that in the next slide. What I like to remind people is that while AWS and Microsoft might both be worth each of them a trillion dollars or more, historically they didn't get there by being a monitoring, a performance monitoring company. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So they have expertise. They have hooks into things. They know how to log things and of that nature. Yeah. But the clouds they built and the performance capabilities and the tools, they really are kind of all over the place. For sure. And, and in reality, um, you know, if you go back to Microsoft, Microsoft is there to sell today capacity. Absolutely. or compute on Azure. I mean, even when System Center came out, it was to help you know, monitor and manage your Windows environments and applications. That's right. So really, you know, AWS, Microsoft, Google, and others, they're not really out there to be a management company, and so they'll, they'll do enough to help you and to try and keep you and, and use more. But as we pointed out earlier on, many organizations are using multiple clouds, up to five cloud environments today. And so how do you have the tools and capabilities to, to help across the board? And that's really where we come in, you know, we, with our hybrid IT operations and management capabilities. It's really to address that, that question, okay, how do I do all this monitoring management and, and helping assure the security of my multi-cloud hybrid IT environment? Um, that's where we bring in the multiple, you know, we've got addressing those challenges of, uh, you know, tool sprawl, addressing the challenges of incompatibilities between uh, monitoring or, or just lack of integration between those capabilities. And that's, uh, if I just drop into the next slide, that really, you know, we, this, this, this is what we're all about. We've built tools for IT professionals. That's where we focus, uh, that ultimately help you monitor, manage, and secure your assets, whether they're deployed on-premises, in hybrid environments, or in multi-cloud environments, with capabilities that can help you across all the areas that we've talked about today. And this slide kind of encapsulates all the things that we do in IT operations management. So there may, you may hear different uh, versions of what IT operations management mean, but it's all about monitoring. So we've got the digital experience, the application performance management, the infrastructure management, so the compute, the storage, the virtualization, network management, uh, pulling in IT security and controlling things, as well as providing a, a service management capability in order to be able to address the many different roles that you either run yourself or that you may have within your organization, the IT ops, the IT security, and the DevOps, and being able to do that wherever your IT sits. So as it's, you know, building on what is your next gen IT environment, as you move into that next step, you know, someone's is here to, to help you on that journey. Mm -hmm. And this just kind of breaks down, we, we have a lot of products. Yeah, they don't really fit on one slide. No, they, it's, it's really tiny. Yes, well, it's tiny for us. Hopefully, uh, your screen is bigger than what we're looking at. But you know, we have a lot of products that are available today, and uh, many of those are based on what we call our Ryan platform. Uh, those are the ones in uh, kind of blue and, and orange. Um, you know, some of them are available uh, to deploy on premises. Some of them are you know, we have many customers actually deploying them out into public cloud environments like AWS and Azure. In fact. Um, some of our products, in fact, uh, all, all of our Orion and, and, and our database performance analyzer are available on the Azure marketplace as well, mm -hmm. just to help simplify and streamline, streamline that deployment. We also have a, a number of SaaS-delivered products as well. So if you think about our application performance management suite, in fact, we've just bought a company, some of you may have heard, uh, Vivid Cortex, which is all about database monitoring for you know, today's modern databases, um, you know, MongoDB, Aurora, and so on and so forth. Um, we, we have quite, uh, quite the range of products to, to help you, uh, again, with your monitoring, management, and securing of those hybrid IT environments. Now, uh, you had, uh, I think you hinted about it, but we also have some SaaS offerings. And I, I noticed in chat somebody mentioned that they just found out that 
we have Paper Trail yep. and Pingdom as well. Yep. So we have some SaaS based offerings too. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, Paper Trail, Pingdom, App Optics, uh, Logly, Logly is another one. Yep. And as I just mentioned, we've just added Vivid Cortex to yep. our portfolio as well. You're not seeing it on this diagram, but uh, you'll definitely be, uh, if you check out our website, and you know, you'll be seeing a lot more about that uh, in, the, uh, in the coming weeks and months. And ultimately, whatever you buy from us, we're there to help make sure that you're successful. And so we have a, a whole slew of support, you know, customer success elements. So whether it's from our, uh, our THWAC community, which is in, in advance of 150,000 active members today, or whether you go through our support, uh, our THWAC community, we've got training, we've got onboarding, success. Anyway, you can kind of see from here, we have uh, you know, several different mechanisms that are available to ensure that you know, if you're a Solomon's customer, you're going to be successful with our products. Um, you know, we really focus on you know, depth of capability, simplicity of use, and affordability. And the last thing that we want you to happen is, is buy our products and have them sit on the shelf. And that's what this is all about, is to make sure that you're successful from day one and, and forwards with our products and you know, being able to see how valuable they are for your environment. Lastly, and just uh, before we get to the Q&A, I just want to point out, if you check out our website, uh, you can actually drill down. This is a, a quick link to our IT operations management solutions. We have quite a few as we've talked about today, but you'll be able to navigate from here into the products themselves, grab them for a free trial. Uh, you can also go off to the Azure Marketplace, deploy them. We also have uh, at least DPA today in uh, the AWS Marketplace as well. So both of those mechanisms will just help you get up and running a lot faster um, and uh, take away some of the hassles of deploying on-premises if you have to you know, think about uh, procuring equipment. So just different ways to get you up and running. And then uh, you know, we'll, we'll be available to, to help you out through there. So with that, uh, I think we'd just like to open up for uh, any Q&A. Yeah, great presentation, Sasha, Thomas. Uh, we got a lot of good feedback as well uh, coming in. Uh, everyone said they love the presentation, SolarWinds rocks. Uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone else who said they're using SolarWinds today. Uh, while we do some q and I'm actually going to bring up this poll question uh, that just says, what additional information would you like about the SolarWinds solution? So um, let's see, first uh, comment here I saw. Uh, Rob said he's interested in moving from on-prem to the Azure marketplace. Uh, so you guys were talking about there are SolarWinds Azure options. Is, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we have uh, a number of customers who are actually actively moving their deployment from on-premises into Azure, or at least exploring it, because there are a number of solutions that uh, that, that enables. You can have a either a staging mechanism, you may want to be trying out some new functionality, or like uh, probably yourself, you're interested in actually moving completely into Azure. So we, we've done a number of webcasts with our customer success team in order to be able to kind of explain the process and how best to achieve that. Um, the, the recommendation that we have is actually to go ahead and deploy the, the modules that you have up into Azure and then migrate the database. Now, that's a simplistic version, but we have those steps and the team is ready to support you. So if you want to get in contact, I mean, check out the customer success portal, get in touch with that team, and they can certainly assist you on that migration. But definitely a, a, you know, a supported and valid option. So good. best of luck with that. Okay. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's see, another question here. Uh, how does the licensing work with SolarWinds products? So we, uh, you know, the, the licensing, it, it varies by product. We uh, definitely the SaaS-based products are more focused on a subscription-based uh, method today uh, that you may be familiar you know, with, which you get with a lot of other SaaS products. The, the remainder of our products are really more focused on a perpetual-based licensing today. Um, so we're always exploring different ways that uh, we can map to the way that you want to purchase, but those are the two main ways that we sell the products today. Um, but uh, we, we're more than happy to, to chat with you about any of those options at any time. Okay, okay, excellent. Uh, let's see, another question here. Do you have products that support migration? Not actually today, no. Uh, Microsoft and AWS, that's one of the big focuses of both of those organizations starting last year and into this year because, of course, they want to help you move into that environment. But our products today don't actually support the migration capability. We, we help you with the optimization of your resources before the migration, but with the volume of, uh, you know, whether it's from those public cloud vendors and some of the other 
partners to actually help you with that migration. Um, you know, that's definitely uh, some, some great assets and resources out there with those companies, but we'll help you with the pre-migration and then once you're actually deployed uh, in public cloud or in other cloud environments, then you know, that's where our IT operations management capabilities come in to help you get that uh, complete view of what's going on. Okay, okay, nice. Uh, this question came in from Brian. He's asking, uh, can SolarWinds help me get ready for IPv6? Are there any tools available from SolarWinds well, that might help with that? Well, our bread and butter is networking tools, but uh, I guess I need to know more about what you mean by get ready for IPv6, but I, I believe yeah. we completely support IPv4 and IPv6. So yeah. I'm certain that whatever your need is, we have a tool that can help you. But if you're looking for like address space and provision, I think we have a free subnet tool. I'm yes, sure. I, I think you're right. So yeah, we, we have uh, quite a few free tools that are available as well. Um, if, if you're open to leaving your contact information or, or if, if there's that ability, we can certainly come back to you with some options on yeah, that one. Absolutely. Um, okay. But uh, as, as Tom pointed out, uh, yeah, whether it's uh, V4 or V6, then our network management and monitoring tools definitely have that capability. Uh, we have, you know, several of them in the, in the network management portfolio, um, but we can certainly talk to you more about that. Okay, nice. Um, and question from Denny, he, he said, you know, there's so much to learn uh, with SolarWinds. Do you have any formal training options or, or any training options uh, that you recommend? Yes, and, and for that I would actually recommend, so we, we have a academy training. So if you go to our Slack community itself, you'll find out a wealth of knowledge and information and other people on the Slack community where you can ask questions and get a response very quickly. Uh, again, our customer success team through the academy program, we offer some uh, online free training as well as some paid options that, uh, that are available just to, to help uh, you know, not just leverage our products, but also learn about the space. So definitely a lot of options, again, looking to, to help you become more knowledgeable about the space as well as how our products can help and how you can best use our products in your environment. So definitely a lot of options there. Okay, okay, excellent. Uh, let's see, uh, this person said, uh, we're DevOps team, uh, how can you help us? DevOps, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a huge area, and it's a huge area uh, of uh, interest for our customers. And, and in fact, we have several tools that can really, or I should say products, not tools, that mm. can, uh, can, can really help in the DevOps space. So we talked a little about our APM suite or our SaaS, some of our SaaS-based products. Um, so especially with the APM suite, with AppOptics, with Logly, PaperTrail, Pingdom, uh, are leveraged a lot by DevOps audiences today in their environments to be able to monitor some of the, the more modern applications. We can certainly extend the capabilities of our traditional products as well, like our Ryan, into monitoring modern applications and custom applications as well. But uh, you know, some of our SaaS products uh, tend to be more tuned to that type of audience. And you know, Tom, you can talk, probably talk a little bit about, more about Vivid Cortex and what we've got well, there. Well, yeah, it's the same thing. With, uh, the whole idea, of course, well, when I think about DevOps, I think about a lot of specialization, or I don't want to say silo. I'll just say you have a lot of moving parts, and there's focus on one particular area. When we showed that product sheet, and I joked how there was a lot up there in tiny fonts, uh, each one of those products is designed to solve very specific needs, and I think that's what fits into the DevOps story. Instead of us sitting here saying you have to buy this one behemoth of a, of a product that does right. all these things. No, no, it's all pick and choose what you need to solve that one problem that you're having right now. And I, I think that fits well with the DevOps. But like you said, uh, there's a lot of SaaS based. And of course, Vivid Cortex is a, a tool that I would say is something to help in, fit in that DevOps story. Be, and it's very focused on database performance monitoring, specifically for Postgres, uh, MySQL, MongoDB, uh, they, we can also help with Redis if you're using that, and of course Aurora. Yeah, well, in fact, uh, just our DPA product is a lot used uh, used a lot. So database performance uh, analyzers use a lot by DevOps. Today. Database performance analyzer is another one. Uh, back in the company that I worked for before SolarWinds, we were customers, and a lot of our devs were using that because they had to do benchmarking and they were coding and they needed to do a lot of testing and they needed some tool that would give them an idea of you know what the problem was and how to go fix it. Yeah. And then just you know, just to emphasize Tom hit a on the a key point there 
as I said, we have lots of products, but uh, you certainly don't need to buy them. We'd love if you bought them all. I'd love that. Um, but uh, you, you, you know, each, each product can stand alone on its own and uh, and really help you with some specific needs that that product addresses. And, and usually, you know, we name our products pretty uh, pretty much along the lines of what they do. So, database performance analyzer. Um, network performance monitor, server and application monitor. Again, these kind of give you an idea of what uh, what, what products we have in in our portfolio. Okay, okay, excellent. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for our Q and A session, uh, Thomas and Sasha. It's been really great having you on the event today. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thanks for your time, and thanks everybody for joining today. Yeah, thanks for having us. For more information on SolarWinds, of course, visit SolarWinds.com. Uh, also, check out the THWAC community. Uh, lots of great resources out there. Uh, we appreciate SolarWinds uh, sponsoring today's event. Thank you very much. And now it's time for our next prize drawing. Uh, we have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Kyle Price of Tennessee. And our next grand prize, another uh, laptop is going to Mark Cranhagen. Cryan Hagen from Ohio. Congratulations, Mark Cryan Hagen from Ohio and Kyle Price from Tennessee. We've got another gift card and another laptop still going out today, so make sure you stay tuned for our next presentation. And with that, here is Flexential. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jason Carlin, Chief Innovations Officer at Flexential. Jason, thanks for being on the event today. Thanks, David, glad to be here. So I thought we would talk a little bit about uh, the ongoing IT transformation and a little bit around edge computing and uh, speak a little bit about Flexential here at the beginning, but really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us today and hopefully you'll learn some stuff through the process. So just a real quick view at the agenda. Building the edge and next generation IT workloads, we're, we're seeing new workloads emerge in the market all the time. So part of this presentation really is about future-proofing IT and how to be relevant and connected in this next generation of computing. Uh, state of the revolution or the evolution, um, really the edge is enabling uh, a new customer experience and our, and our requirements around that customer experience and what we actually expect every single day is changing very rapidly, kind of under our, even under our feet as we're not even noticing. And then some of the solution areas that I would consider uh, key parts of this, which would include the network, um, how edge and artificial intelligence interact, um, a lot about culture and DevOps and security and how they play together. And then this other area called the boomerang effect that we see uh, with a lot of our customers that are still trying to sort out where the best place to go put a workload might be. And then we've got some time for some questions as well. So quickly about Flexential, we are a, a national IT provider based here in the United States which are, with a great set of markets, uh, 20 markets across the US, uh, 40 data centers. Those data centers are connected together with a very robust network that also provides connectivity into Asia, Europe, and South America. And we also offer cloud and, and uh, network and security services through this portfolio as well. And so really it allows customers to come into one of our facilities and really have access to a broad set of network capabilities all the way to the hyperscalers for uh, software-defined networking, um, all the way to maybe even branch offices as they start to try to solve advanced computing problems. We also have a cloud solution that sits inside these facilities. This platform is, is VMware Cloud Verified. Uh, we use our own managed services team to power this platform, so really it's an augmentation of your staff, 24-7 uh, by 7 monitoring and support, um, really as a partner in terms of your, of your staff to help uh, solve for existing workloads and also new workloads in a, both a hosted private cloud and a multi-tenant cloud environment. And we also have a great set of professional services that augment this that really help customers with, with this transformation that we've been talking about. Uh, so this is a highly certified uh, group of experts, uh, PCI QSAs, Microsoft certified, Amazon Advanced Consulting Partner, Zero, and the list goes on and on. I'm also supporting a lot of our conversations that we've been having with uh, customers that want to look at Amazon Outpost recently as an extension to this edge computing phenomena. So I thought I'd spend just a few minutes on what we're seeing in the market today. And I kind of mentioned um, in the agenda that, that there's been some changes that really have kind of just happened that we didn't even notice. Um, as I was looking at the year kind of gone by in 2019 and, and sort of preparing for 2020, there was a couple of of, of actually three key stats that I noticed. 
One is actually the, the desktop traffic or the desktop server traffic on the internet has actually uh, changed from, from you know, over 50% to, to really 50%. So now there's almost equal mobile traffic um, going over the internet um, to all the servers that we house in these big complex data centers. Um, this is only going to grow with things like 5G and, and better mobility and better platform access, and that's an exciting area. Another area is how we actually consume television. So this year, or I'm sorry, in 2019, we actually crossed over from um, the amount of time people spend with a cable provider to the amount of time people spend streaming. And so I know from my own usage that I spend way more time streaming content now than using my old cable box. But this year, in, in 2019, it just finally crossed over. And then shopping, which I, I think we're all probably now just paying the bills from that uh, wonderful holiday season a couple uh, weeks ago. Um, we've spent more time shopping online than in stores. And, and some people have asked, wow, that seems like we would have done that a long time ago. This is on a global basis. So this is um, really across the entire world. We've spent more hours shopping just for the holidays online than shopping in, in retail stores. So big shifts in how we consume technology big shifts in how we uh, actually get that technology to our door. You know, the, the joke about the box, you know, the box now just arrives within an hour rather than we used to go to these big box stores, which don't really even exist anymore to do our holiday shopping. So lots of changes in this industry, which really sets up a foundation for the changes of the future. Another, another foundational shift is really where we are with the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. Um, this continues to grow very, very dynamically. And we're seeing this in some very specific areas like smart cities, industrial and manufacturing, uh, healthcare is a big, a big piece of this. All of us are still waiting for all the autonomous cars to arrive, but there's actually a lot of technology rolling out every single uh, quarter from the car manufacturers that really help us drive more safely and help us be more efficient. So this is an area that continues to gain steam and with technologies like 5G as that rolls out, we'll continue to pick up as well. All of this access to more information, more data, more technology, more sensors is what is really driving this opportunity. And so not only have we been dealing with the business data of the past, the sort of structured and unstructured data that most of us have in file shares and things like that, we're now having to deal with sensor data that are coming from all these distributed computing environments, as well as human data. You think about how much, how much data you personally generate every day if you're on Facebook or Instagram, how much your connected health app might be generating about what you've done today, you know, maybe you're logging what you eat. Um, so all of these are data sources that are being increasingly used in a variety of different formats that really change the game and how we're able to take that data and then actually generate uh, uh, better lives, better uh, patient outcomes, um, uh, more efficiency in our in our day to days, whether we're trying to drive cars, you know, in very congested cities. So all of this technology really takes um, takes that and, and and brings it to something that really changes ultimately what the customer experience or the consumer experience or the user experience might be. And again, we're just at the beginning of all of this, which is a really exciting time. Um, but we have some some other areas that we're we're still uh, sorting through as well, and wanted to talk just quick quickly on those as well. So. We, we've been in this world of, of cloud computing for, you know, probably since 2006, I think, officially. Um, the joke here is, is all my problems started when I was adopted. Um, and a lot of our customers, when I talk to them, are, are still trying to figure out what the cloud is for solving problems today. And uh, where is it? You know, how much does it cost? How much does it really cost? Because, you know, sometimes the the analysis you do up front is quite different than the results that you might see when you actually get the bill. And, and there's you know stories of startups that have taken a budget for a year and basically have blown through it within a couple of months. So it's really hard to take some of the tools that the hyperscalers um, have and uh, make a lot of sense of it because frankly, it's hard to understand technology and how it's used on a minute by minute or second by second basis. And that's really key when you're starting to price the cloud and trying to look at that as a solution. We have some customers that don't want to be locked in. You know, they might actually be locked in, and then all of a sudden, you know, a, one of the hyperscalers starts competing with them as well and selling very similar products. So that's an issue as well. You know, security and compliance are uh, consistently one of the top one or two issues that most um, companies are considering either taking workloads in or taking workloads out of the cloud. Um, and that's an interesting area because it, 
you can't really send an auditor to a hyperscale or a cloud platform. So they got to be uh, very comfortable with the tools that the provider gives them to be able to do the audits and allow you to put your trust into their services. And then the network continuously, even, even I was at reInvent um, a couple weeks ago, and I heard from some of the leadership um, there that, you know, the network continues to be really a challenge for uh, a lot of implementations around hyperscale technology. Um, so this is an area that we continue to see as well. And um, again, no, no inherent, you know, problems with using cloud technology and hyperscalers. These are all just things that we have to consider as we go forward because it is, it is complicated. The other area, and I was, you know, reminded about this this morning as a happy Monday surprise, um, you know, the bad guys never stop. Um, you know, social engineering is always out there. Um, it's, it's based in, you know, unpatched software and operating systems, which, you know, if anybody's tried to keep up with the change rate of, of dealing with patches, it is really hard. Um, and it's also being driven by the change rate just we see in the industry. You know, we talked about how, how the Internet of Things continues to proliferate and we're adding more and more devices. So this is an area that just kind of gets worse and worse as it goes by, unless you can really take a very concerted effort in terms of tackling these types of problems. So uh, phishing attacks, denial of service, you know, now we've got Bitcoin out there that can help power this because you have an anonymous uh, platform to go pay people. And then we also have a constantly changing set of privacy and compliance and disclosure requirements that, that is hard to keep up with too. So, I mean, California just announced what, what they're doing uh, that came online here earlier uh, this year in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've all sur survived the GDPR um, push. Um, we all probably see a new privacy notice every single day, at least 10 times maybe. And then there's also what the credit card industry and other industries like HIPAA are doing with their um, protocols and their standards, continuing to try to, to, to keep ahead of the bad guys, whether that's more segmentation, whether that's additional audits, you know, different types of areas. So keeping up with all of this is, is really hard, which really means that we've got to think about uh, IT, you know, a little bit differently in this future world of, of fast moving IoT edge applications. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about the network. Um, the network is really key to uh, any of the experiences that we have today. Um, the network is the computer in, 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 many, in many senses, and we've gotten very used to network application delivery, whether that's our email, whether that's Salesforce, our CRM, you know, whatever it might be. If the network's not up, people aren't getting work done. And, you know, the edge, as we continue to add more data to our networks, um, starts to get stressed with the amount of data that's being brought into the system, analyzing it, and then being able to do something with that. So um, what we're seeing is more customers looking at uh, deploying applications in a distributed fashion really on the edge. And that helps to solve for latency, which ultimately provides a better customer experience. Um, and that latency can only really be solved with geography. So it's about getting applications really closer to where the consumer is, closer to where the user is, closer to where the computation is. And um, you know, a great example of this would be you know, looking at smart uh, traffic, um, smart uh, transportation initiatives inside of a inside of a city, you can't have that data go across the U.S. You know, that might take 80 to 100 milliseconds to get a response back. It has to be very hyper local, and so being able to deploy that application very close to that jurisdiction is key. Um, and that customer experience um, only is going to get uh, more sort of dialed in here as we go because the 5G network actually reduces latency on the on the on the radio side or the the cell phone side by almost 50 or, or 75 percent so what is is 40 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds of time goes down to like five in the world of 5g so then it's all just about the applications and this is an area that we'll have to help our uh, application folks uh, understand and and provide uh, again, better solutions that help optimize for latency. Uh, market growth is another area. Um, a lot of us, I live in Denver, it's a fast growing environment. Um, so being able to deal with that growth rate and then future proofing applications as more and more technologies go out to uh, the Internet of Thing and mobile applications. So I talked a little bit about this just as a, as a couple of examples. So, you know, traditionally large scale applications live in either the cloud, like a hyperscale or like Amazon or they live in data centers like ours. Um, this, I think, is a, is a picture of one of our facilities here in Atlanta. 
Um, and then there's the next uh, uh, sort of set of services that move to the edge. You know, that edge might be a neighborhood, that edge might be a region within a city, but getting a lot closer to um, where those customers um, actually are. And then ultimately, kind of near-prem or on-prem, which is where the sensors are going to be deployed. That's actually a picture down at the lower left there, I'm um, sorry, lower, lower right, of, uh, of a tower um, sitting inside of, of Denver, where there's actually uh, a 72-inch rack deployed in that, in that tower um, that then has a Wi-Fi and a 5G um, base station built into it as well. So different technologies that are coming to play to really bring this latency down and allow us to develop new applications to offload traffic and make faster decisions to power these next generation applications. So ultimately, just to say it one more time, you know, what we're seeing is, is data needs to be much closer to the users. And as, as more and more data transfers over the network, speed of light is, is a constant thing. And so while we're making bigger pipes, we're not necessarily making the bits move faster. So being able to power these next generation uh, platforms, it's all about bringing those applications uh, more local. And a great example just recently of, of how this has, has progressed is the announcement of um, outposts with, with Amazon at reInvent, um, not, not so much the announcement, but the going GA here at the last reInvent uh, in, in December. So Outpost, for those um, that need an introduction, is a, is, a, is a subset of the Amazon Web Services platform that allows customers to run these applications within any of their data centers, so not having to go transfer data and workloads to the hyperscale platforms like an Amazon, you know, West or uh, Bay Area or East or Ashburn, um, but able to do it within their existing uh, co-location environment. So you get all the power of Amazon sort of sitting right behind your own firewall, which reduces latency, allows the hardware to sort of sit inside of your environment, not somebody else's, lets you have more control, and it leverages the same tools and platforms and capabilities uh, that you have with the hyperscalers, which is great because if you want to enable DevOps, which is really the, the way of application deployment of the future, it allows you to keep up with some of the change rate that we've been talking about in the presentation. You've got to have tools and platforms that allow you to run DevOps types of, of tools and, and, and capabilities. So um, Outpost is a great example of this. Um, Azure Stack is another great example of this. Um, Azure Stack comes to the market a little bit differently. Outpost, you actually you know, rent from Amazon directly. Azure Stack, you get from your favorite hardware provider like a Dell EMC or a Cisco, and you're able to go bring that right next to your existing uh, servers and storage. Um, or uh, Google has even taken a different approach, which said, look, we're going to give you a, a different cloud management platform that allows you to uh, run your applications in this new hybrid sort of model using a consistent pane of glass. So these are all ideas that sort of help solve for bigger distributed deployments that really help enable this edge thinking of, of low latency applications that need to serve the customer better. And then, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, the future is distributed, you know, DevOps is a great model. I think the key to this slide really is there's a lot of stuff here. If you're not in a DevOps sort of world or portfolio at this point in terms of how you manage um, your set of products or technologies, you, need, you want to get there, and you don't want to forget about security. Security needs to be integrated into this process as well. So, you know, a lot of people call it security DevOps or Sec DevOps. Super important to be able to consider that uh, to keep up with the change rate, not only of what your customers need and your internal customers, but also what the market needs and what a lot of our vendors, you know, really are giving us in terms of their own internal change rate with changing their platforms, giving us new patches and being able to test that and being secure at the end of the day. And finally, the, the big G word, I like to call it governance with a little G, um, but you know, governance is, is important, right? And so a lot of the customers that um, I've worked with that have said, hey, how can you help uh, me sort of take my applications and, and right size them so they're not as costly um, as they are uh, on the cloud? How do I better right size the environment? Are there applications that might just make more sense inside a co-location because I have very tight control and I want to go buy the hardware and depreciate it, governance is key. So being able, being able to monitor what your developers are up to, uh, giving them the tools um, and working with them in this DevOps approach uh, to sort of control that spend, um, you know, have a, a team that's, you know, maybe the size of a, 
a couple of large pizzas in terms of lunch. Um, but just make sure that security is an active part of that. And it's re really security is everybody's job rolling through this governance framework. And again, it doesn't have to be hardcore, um, but having some sort of governance standard is really important to keeping up with this change. So, so finally here, the, the customer experience really is what is king in terms of, or queen in the, in the world of the edge. And we'll see this sort of great crossover that just sort of started in 19, continue to progress with more over the top, more IoT, more mobility with the release of 5G and the maturity. Um, but edge and, and sort of location can solve a lot of network latency issues. Security very much has to be part of that equation. And, uh, you know, think about culture in terms of how to, to solve, um, you know, uh, uh, DevOps problems as you as you think about your day-to-day. -day. So with that, I wanted to turn it over to uh, some questions. Yeah, absolutely, Jason. Great presentation. Uh, let's see here. We do have some questions coming in from the audience. So um, the first one I wanted to ask you is about uh, the boomerang effect. You were talking about that, and this person's uh, asking, how long do you think the boomerang effect will last? <laughs> um, how long will it last? So how long will the moving applications around to try to figure out where they're the most optimized? Um, you know, I've seen some data uh, recently. I think IBM has a great survey out there that sort of shows this, that we're really in the early stages of trying to figure this out. Uh, more than 90% of applications are still sitting inside of, of on-premise environment, sitting on servers that people run every day. Uh, it's going to take a considerable amount of time to refactor those technologies and bring them to, to new capabilities and, and um, you know, new platforms like Kubernetes or containers. So I think it's, it's easily a, a, a 10 year, a 10 year plus problem, but I also think um, the amount of, of uh, innovation that is being delivered in the market by companies like NVIDIA and Intel, um, they're giving that power to everybody. So there's a little bit of a democratization aspect here too of avoiding necessarily the vendor lock-in. You know, Amazon's a platform, Microsoft's a platform. If you don't want to use all their tools, you kind of you're kind of stuck having to go reinvent things, but you're still locked in. And I think I think a lot of customers really want some choice, you know, as they start to to mature and drive those applications. So I think it'll last a long time. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Right. So you know, you talked about hybrid IT, and this person's asking, do you think hybrid IT is going to be the norm for the next four to five years? Um, I think hybrid is is the norm today. Uh, I think we're in we're in a um, a mode where we're shifting from what I would call multi-cloud, which was sort of the immature version of hybrid, uh, to really you know to to truly hybrid, where uh, we've taken our DevOps tooling, we've taken tools like Terraform and and Hashi's you know platform, and used it to help drive application delivery. And I think that's what really hybrid is about. It's about being able to truly scale that application for seasonality issues from my local cloud to my, my remote cloud. Um, it's about being able to deal with load issues dynamically. You know, we're starting to get used to the networking, you know, pieces of, of just basic multi-cloud. You know, the next piece is really how does the network work in hybrid? How do we secure that? But I, I really do think we're maturing that, that direction as well. Okay, okay. And then you talked about outposts. Um, John here, he's asking, you mentioned outposts. Is that something that Flex Central is working on or something Flex Central offers? Yes, we, we do a couple of areas or do a couple of things there with, with outposts. Um, one, we've, we've got some cloud uh, readiness assessment services that can help customers gauge the applications that they might have either on-prem um, or applications they might have in AWS today and say, hey, you know, does it make sense for us to look at outposts considering our network costs or latency or things like that? Um, and then, so if that makes sense, we can kind of run through that, that total cost of ownership and see if that's a logical conclusion. It's very expensive to move data. So, you know, with, if you can bring advanced technology closer to your data, I think it's actually more cost effective. And then um, secondly, we've got services that can help with the implementation. So um, uh, the network implementation and so forth, obviously sitting inside of Flexential's co-location and network environment, providing space and power and cooling and security and things like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It definitely sounds like a, a great option for the future. Um, another question came in. They're asking about subsea cables. You talked about subsea cables to South America. Do you have more connections planned? Well, it's a, it is a very dynamic growing space. Um, the, you know, traffic is, is increasingly 
uh, ramping both in North America and outside of, of North America. And uh, it used to be Europe was the hot area and then APAC kind of be the hot, it became the hot area. You know, South America, Latin America is sort of the, the, the up and coming area. So I, I think as we, as we see more applications develop and continue this uh, global economy, we'll definitely see more subsea cable. You know, subsea cables are about optimizing for latency at the end of the day, which we touched on a lot. So I think we'll continue to see a lot of those builds. Okay, very nice. And then probably the last question that we have time for here, and that is, I mean, how should someone get started with Flexential? Well, so one thing you can do is, is uh, anybody that listened to this presentation will get a copy of our Boomerang Effect uh, G-Book. Um, within that G-Book, there'll be some contact information for us that um, you can go ahead and reach out. Otherwise, just go to www.flexential.com. We've got a great chat tool, very easy to get engaged with us from there. Awesome, awesome. And I should mention that that uh, G-Book, as you're calling it, is available for download uh, right here in the handouts tab in the audience console. So you should be able to download that PDF right now and you can check it out after the event. Uh, Jason, it's been really great having you on the Megacast today. Thank you. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. For more information on Flex Central, of course, visit flexcentral.com and check out the Boomerang Phenomenon G book there in the audience console. All right. Thank you, Jason. Uh, while we do our final prize announcement, I'm just going to bring up this poll question. Uh, that is, what additional information would you like about the Flexential solution? Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, Jason just has tremendous insight into what's going on in the industry today. So um, also got a lot of good feedback from folks. Uh, let, let's see, um, Matthew and uh, a few other folks. Sorry, I lost it in the chat there. Uh, who said they were using Flex Central already and really enjoying the service. Uh, they use it as their colo, works great. Love to hear that. Thank you so much. All right. Our final prize announcement. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Bob Dudley from Texas. And our final grand prize, we've got a laptop going to Attila Bocor from Michigan. Congratulations. Bob Dudley from Texas and Attila Bocor from Michigan. If you did not win a prize on today's event, no worries, we've got a lot of upcoming events uh, over at events.actualtechmedia.com. Watch your email inbox for invitations to those. Don't forget to answer that poll question before you go. And uh, don't forget to Subscribe to the 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store. Uh, follow Actual Tech Media on LinkedIn. And if you are a potential sponsor of an upcoming event, you can reach us at connect at actualtechmedia.com to chat about presenting. And finally, I hope you'll join us on our next event. Uh, that is the Cloud Strategies and Solutions Ecocast coming up on January 22nd. That is a week from today. You'll hear from Nutanix, Datacore, Druva, Pure Storage, NetApp, and Clumio. So going to be some great presentations on there. Hope that you'll join us on that event. Uh, visit events.actualtechmedia.com to register for that. I hope everyone had a great time and really enjoyed the event. I know that I did. I will see you next time. Have a great day.